respected president the urological society of india professor anand kumar chairman indian school of urology professor rajiv sood president elect urological society of india dr c mallikarjuna co chairman indian school of urology uh, dr arun chawla international faculties dr philip urological society of india professor anand kumar chairman of indian school of urology professor rajiv sood president elect urological society of india dr anishment the respected uh, eminent faculties from urological society of india the urologists uh, from india and members from sa countries good evening everyone today we are having the the webinar on uh, penile and testicular management and uh, the collaboration and research activities and this webinar will be moderated by dr gajan gau uh, prakash from tata memorial hospital uh, i on behalf of the council of urological society of india and indian school of urology welcome you all to this uh, webinar uh, with this uh, few words i request uh, the president of urological society of india professor anand kumar to give his address over to you sir a good evening to everybody and good afternoon to some of our international faculty dr andrea dr philips dr dansman and uh, dr uh, rajiv sood from dr tp rajiv and all the faculty and participants i welcome you all to uh, this a uh, very important webinar on testicular and penile cancer both cancers are not very common but they are integral part of the urology especially testicular cancer actually i must say i was very fascinated because when i was in our general surgery training there is that our doctor professor s k khanna he used to do rp lnd and he used to be a one of the very major operation and he start used to start in the morning and finish in the evening and the incision first thing he used to ask me to give incision from epigastric to pubic symphysis and he start mobilizing the colon then he will join and then uh, so that uh, inspired us and uh, when in sanjay gandhi we used to do uh, more and more cases of rpl nd because most of the patient used to come but slowly the number of patients are coming down and i think more and more chemotherapies are given so that's why less and patients are picked up early and less rpl nds are now done and next excitement has come up with the development of this robotic surgery both for the rpl nd and uh, and uh, pelvic limb uh, this uh, inguinal lymph node dissection so that is the new development which we are doing it and it excited us to restart some of the surgery but number of patients are less but this is a very important aspects and uh, this is one of the cancer testicular cancer which is completely almost curable uh, unless it is picked very late even in late stages since patients are young chemotherapy is very effective they are taken care of and uh, so this is a very important aspect apart from that we are also going to discuss the very the one thing which we are hoping and imagining and trying to do it is the collaboration of the various institution and uh, some uh, ground has covered something has started in uh, euro oncology some of the collaboration has started software is made usi has invested money and usi has a plan to move further and that is our another reason that we should have a collaborative study and get the national data which can be used for the and uh, so that is another important thing which we are going to discuss and uh, so at the same time as a president of the rajya society, society of india i pray for the good health of all our members all the delegates all the participants and uh, please take care of yourself stay safe don't lower your guard and so that you remain healthy and looking after your patients and i'm sure very soon the corona virus will be defeated and uh, we will be back to our physical meeting and uh, but i must say this virtual meeting has we have learned a lot even if the next physical meeting will not remain the same there will be a component of the virtual also and there will be hybrid meetings even in all the physical meeting will also have a hybrid component 
so with that i welcome you again for this uh, wonderful uh, webinar and uh, and uh, thank you for joining it and i inaugurate this uh, webinar now this webinar is open for the discussion back to dr so for your uh, enlightening words now i request the chairman indian school of urology dr rajiv su to give his address over to you sir uh thank you rajiv uh i bring greetings from indian school of urology today's webinar is uh, really special it is for the uh, one fact that in the section in the sub section of uh, uro oncology we are today dealing with the penile and testicular cancers and they are the not that common cancers which urologists are handling and not only that in india the effort and uh, like atlas project and all of icmr they are uh, concentrated on other uh, cancer which are more common and uh, our uh, urological cancers even prostate cancer is not covered in that and that is the irony and the other gray area is that who is the owner of the data whether it is multi modality treatment the radiation people are treating oncologists are treating and also the uh, surgical uh, oncology and uro uh, urologists are treating and uh, in this uh, uncommon um, lip uh, treated cancer when uh, the data is also imp uh, import important and the processing of data accumulating the data the merits in the merits of that collaboration and how to collaborate it is a big effort and if we are successful in these two cancers we will be very easily successful for other urological cancers and uh, the, uh, with this background this uh, symposia uh, or this webinar which is uh, uh, the collaborated by, by the indian urologists the sarc countries and also our uh, esteem um, uh, faculty international uh, danishman uh, nasty and uh, spice and also the presence of our president uh, dr anand kumar and uh, uh, future president uh, the incoming president dr uh, malkarjun is there with the um, uh, efforts of rajiv tp and rajiv kumar from aims i think this is going to be wonderful treat and which we all are going to share this is the way forward how we are taking step by step we have myself and rajiv tp we visited also uh, us the aua headquarters how they are uh, tackling with the data how they are collecting how they are maintaining the secrecy and how their collaborative uh, uh, efforts are being done there i think usi is uh, taking very important steps we are in a very important stage of growth of urology in uh, india and also to take india's place the due place in the global scenario this will go long way all the wishes to dr uh, gagan prakash uh, for, for uh, who is uh, overall uh, convener of this symposia and also the moderators of uh, various uh, sessions very beautifully um, uh, um, crafted sessions and uh, with this i bring again the best wishes from indian school of urology thank you thank you sir for your good words uh, now i uh, request uh, dr gagan prakash the convener for this webinar penile and testicular management the gray zones in 2020 and his collaboration the way forward uh, to carry forward this session over to you gagan thank you sir uh, i hope i am well audible yeah 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 uh, thank you urological society of india and indian school of urology for interesting me with this uh, responsibility Globally, penile and testicular cancers are classified as rare genital urinary cancers. In India, uh, we probably have a slightly higher incidence of penile cancer compared to many other de developed nations. Rare cancers suffer from lack of strong evidence in various aspects of its management. One way of generating evidence is to conduct multi-institutional studies or collaborative studies. If Indian centers routinely managing these cancers join hands. 
I think we have the potential to fill the evidence gaps that are glaring at us. While all of us are learning new things through webinars, we thought of integrating the concept of collaboration, which is the likely way forward and is possibly made easier these days with the current methods of communication, which this pandemic has taught us. USI intends to discuss its vision and pathways and challenges in conducting national and international collaborative studies, which could be very relevant to these cancers. In addition to the top office bearers of USI and ISU, we are fortunate to have the company of three very distinguished international faculty with immense experience in translational and clinical research and collaborative studies related to these two cancers. Let me now hand over the baton to our moderators for the first session on penile cancer. Dr. Mahinder and Dr. Rakesh Sharma. Uh, good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would, uh, we, myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Mahindra, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Anand Kumar, President USI, Dr. C. Malikarjan, President-elect USI, Dr. Uh, Rajiv D.P. Honorary Secretary USI, and uh, Dr. Rajiv Sood, and Dr. Arun Chawla, sir, from the ISU, and Dr. Gagan Prakash for giving us this opportunity to moderate this session on penile cancer. So we have been given the task to moderate the session on penile cancer. Uh, we have renowned speakers, uh, two international faculty and uh, around 10 national faculty. Uh, so my colleague, Dr. Mahindra would be introducing uh, the international faculty uh, briefly. Mahindra, you can take over. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. So I'm sharing my screen. Uh, is it uh, visible to all? No. 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 Now? No. Yeah, it started now. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you, uh, USI and uh, ISU and Dr. Gagan uh, for uh, giving opportunity. So let's uh, not wasting uh, so time. So let's introduce uh, the international faculty is uh, Dr. Uh, Philip A. A. Space. He is a professor of Department of uh, 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 Tumor Biology and Assistant Chief of Surgical Services and Director of uh, Virtual Health of the Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute University of South of Florida. He has published over many peer-reviewed manuscripts and has edited five textbooks in neurologic oncology. He is also a vice chair of NCCN panel and, on bladder and penile cancer and a member of international editorial board, including neurological oncology. And also a chair, he is a chair of uh, American Neurological Association core curriculum of education. Our second international faculty is Dr. Andrea uh, Nechi, the faculty at uh, Neurological Oncology in the Department of Medical Oncology, uh, IRCS Institute of Nationalized uh, in Milan, Italy. And he generally, uh, sorry, focuses on the medical treatment of germ cell tumors and other GU cancer, including novel drugs and experimental therapies. He won many prestigious awards in field of uh, medical oncology. It was uh, uh, numerous. And member of, he also a member of Penile Cancer Guideline Panel in the European Association of Urology and member of ESMO Faculty Group of Genital Cancer and member of ESMO Oncology PRO Working Group. You can start so, with the first. So now I would like to uh, invite uh, our uh, first speaker, Dr. Santosh Menon. Uh, he is uh, the surgical pathology professor in surgical pathology, especially uh, dealing with the uro oncopathology, and uh, he is uh, speaking on uh, is very is everything right within the present AGCC staging. Dr. Menon, sir, it's over to you now. Yeah, thank you, Mahindra, and thank you, uh, uh, Rakesh. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, USA Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Anand Kumar and uh, ISU Dr. Rajiv Sood. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. Hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and thank you, Gagan, for giving me this topic. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, sir. We can see you. Sir. Okay. So um, the topic which has been given to me uh, is titled as Is Everything Right with the Current AJCC8 Tradition Staging for Penine Cancer? And I put a two queries uh, on front of it. Um, so before we begin this session, this is the opening batsman. This is for the international faculty 
in india we we uh, worship lord shiva and his phallus this is the phallus so uh, for us uh, the penis is a revered organ uh, uh, even 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 in our uh, scriptures and vedas uh, uh, with that but uh, strangely the penile cancer does not get that much importance in our country and penile pathology is uh, badly lacking in in most of the centers uh, however at tmh we see good amount of cases and with that i began my presentation uh, so the penile cancer is vast majority are squamous carcinomas and most common area, uh, is in the glands about for 50 to 50 to 60 percent of the cancers would occur in the glands followed by the foreskin and the coronal sulcus uh, if you look at this this is the cross section uh, most uh, all of your surgeons here i need not tell you the cross sectional anatomy of this uh, but it is important to know that uh, gland penis is purely and mostly composed of the corpus spongiosus and that's important for when we come to the staging of the penile cancers uh, if you look at histopathology this is what we report uh, within the within the histopathological report what is the type of the tumor uh, with squamous or any other type of cancer what is the exact site the size in centimeter on gross the pattern of growth the grade is very important anatomical levels form one of the important landmarks for for staging of of uh, penile cancers we also give the depth of invasion in millimeter there are several studies which state that more than 4 mm certain studies state more than 6 mm depth of invasion is 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 of consequence in the prognosis of tumor uh, lvsi pni margins of resection and any pre cancer region so that's the histopathology report in in resection specimens of penile cancer which we report Uh, if you look at the 2016 classification the main uh, uh, change which was brought about was that penile cancers are now classified as non hp when hp related i will not go into details because my talk mainly uh, deals with the staging of penile cancer these are a couple of pictures for for the non pathologists in this all are non pathologists this is how a squamous carcinoma looks under the microscope these are the bad looking cells which you see and uh, we do p16 now uh, on almost all specimens of penile uh, cancers to pick up the strong p16 staining for for hpv association um, so this is another picture just to show grade which is very very important again in prognosis and i am showing you this picture because this is going to play play an important role even in the staging of penile tumors the com coming to the issues in penile dissections i think the grading of cancer especially grade 1 grade 2 becomes a real issue in penile cancers uh, pathology directs the nodal dissection so whether the nodes is going to be involved the risk stratification all depends on pathological factors and accurate peach staging is necessary uh, but in as a pathologist i i can tell you that there are severe serious issues in recognition of anatomical landmarks in the penis especially corpus spongiosum and corpus cavernosum uh, especially when the pathologist is not very much aware of penectomy specimen they don't get these kind of specimen then it's difficult to recognize these anatomical landmarks so this is just a picture to show you that Uh, the tumors may be like these a uh, very so you may have a just a lamina invasive tumor or uh, uh, in the prepuce or in the glands uh, in the glands also you can have a pt1 tumor another tumor can go into the completely into the corpus spongiosum and a large tumor may completely destroy all the landmarks and invade the corpus spongiosum as well as the cavernosum so this is the most important slide uh, as far as my presentation is concerned the difference between agcc 7th and 8th i'll i'll be confining myself more to the pt staging Uh, of the tnm uh, so if you look at seventh edition the t1 tumors that is the lamina invasive tumors were divided into t1a and t1b based on whether lvsi pni uh, were present or the tumor was grade 3 and t2 was either corpus cavernosum or spongiosum involvement was called as t2 and pt3 involvement was called as t3 uh, if you look at the difference between this compared to the eighth edition the main difference has a reason in the t2 and t3 uh, staging of the penile cancer so in seventh it, both spongiosum and cavernosum were t2 whereas in eighth edition they have recognized and separated out spongiosum and cavernosum based on studies from md anderson and other few studies that the outcome the dfs the rfs of these patients who in whom the tumor invaded the cavernosum was worse compared to those involving the spongiosum so the question and the topic uh, my topic is whether this is true and whether this has been validated whether this is really really going forth uh, would this stay on or would this change uh, so the questions we need to address is this eight edition final are there improvements likely in these and what are the issues and shortcomings of this day so i'll highlight you highlight few few uh, literature is said so this was this was a study in 2018 which said that uh, 
there is no difference between spongiosal and cavernous. So this is after the AGCC 8th uh, edition has come up. This study proposed that, uh, that there is no difference between the outcome of uh, tumors which invade the spongiosa and cavernosa. Another study uh, from from uh, China and a group from China is that, that modified uh, clinical pathological tumor stadium has to be used. And they highlighted that importance of LVSI. So we know that in seventh edition, uh, they have included LVSI in T1 tumors. But uh, the, this study suggested that even T2 and T3 tumors, you have to include LVSA, and LVSA is going to play more and more important role in the staging of tumors. Uh, this is a study, uh, again, from Sebastian Halter, saying that, uh, again, saying that LVSA has got uh, the shortest metastasis free. So a lymph node metastasis and LVI are very, very significant. So what has been coming after the AJCC 8th edition is that LVI, PNI, these are going to be important factors in the risk stratification and as well as staging. I think this is, will be taken up by Dr. Philip Spy, so I'll not go into the details of this study. Uh, as a pathologist, I'm just showing you a couple of pictures. This is corpus spongiosum, which has got very thick wall erectile blood vessels. Uh, in comparison, this is the corpus cavernosum, which has got very slit-like and thin walled blood vessels. Uh, but in a given sample, the difference between these would be very, very difficult to pick up under the microscope, especially to the unaware pathologist who is not used to seeing penectomy system. Coming to a couple of our own studies, we had uh, done this study of risk to scoring of these uh, patients of penectomy uh, based on the grade of the tumor, anatomical compartment, and pattern of invasion. And we devised uh, some risk scoring grouping in which we divided into, we found that a low risk group and a high risk and a very high risk group have got different uh, chances of uh, metastasis into the nodes. And this was significant, and we published this last year in, in October and November. Uh, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves to show that uh, how these risk groups uh, separate out on, on, on DFS based on our risk scoring. Uh, and based on that, we did give it some recommendations uh, of what should be done in these risk groups uh, based on this pattern of invasion and other features. Uh, the other thing we did, which we did uh, and which was presented in AAVA in 2019, Dr. Spies and Dr. Daneshman were there in the in the gathering and that meeting. Uh, we in our study did not find any difference in DFS and OS between uh, uh, the tumors which invaded the corpora cavernosa versus the tumor which invaded corpus spongiosa. So uh, we definitely feel that uh, although there are conflicting studies between cavernosa and spongiosa involvement. Uh, the staging would, would need to be relooked in a couple of them. Uh, this is the one of the latest studies which we published in one of the very, very prestigious uh, American journal. And in this, we have again modified. So the problem as a pathologist is sometimes we cannot distinguish between corpus spongiosa and cavernosa uh, uh, invading tumors. Uh, so we said that T2 tumors should be considered which do not have LVI, PNA, and are not grade 3. This is similar to what is already present in AJS, uh, AJCC 8th edition. Uh, they divide in which the T1 tumors have LVI, PNI, and are not grade 3, and they are using that same criteria. We, we applied this on T2 and T3 tumors uh, and score, sort of created these categories. So, and sorry, to, this, sorry to interrupt, yeah, Dr. Finish, I'm finishing. This is the last slide. Last slide. Sure, sure, sir. Based on this, uh, we have come out with a proposed staging that uh, we, rather than corpus spongiosa and cavernosa, some, we, we, you need to include more and more of these pathological parameters like PNI, LVI, and GRADE uh, into the staging system, uh, also including the HPV also might help in changing. So these are the issues in AGS, AJCC 8th edition which are need to be seen. And these are the changes which probably would be expected in AJCC in the coming years. So uh, these are the my acknowledgments. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Menon, sir. So uh... We have a, a one question uh, uh, from Dr. Ranjit sir from Medisec. Like, uh, does urethral involvement uh, ACC to eighth staging come under T4? Which one? Which one? Sorry. Urethral involvement. Urethral involvement. So urethral involvement is not there in in in, in uh, unfortunately in T, uh, AJC seventh. The PT3 was considered urethra, but they have sort of discarded the urethra completely in HACC 8. So that's the main query which is there. See, urethra becomes a separate organ which is traversing the whole length of the penis. And initially in 7th edition, it was included as in, in the staging, but in 8th uh, edition, they have sort of uh, neglected it. Again, the tip of the urethra, there are a lot of queries whether the tip of the urethra needs to be included. There are separate urethral cancers. There are studies 
I mean, with separate urethral cancers and 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 uh, have squamous as well as transitional kind of morphology. So uh, those issues need still need to be addressed. So oh, very uh, nice presentation, sir. So I just have a, a one query actually yeah. about uh, not about the your topic, but something different. But particular pathology only. Uh, sure. The the frozen section. so do we do we need a frozen section in every patient because somewhere we so we see that it is a distal tumor and clinically we can see uh, as a surgeon if there's a no tumor and we can we can take a margin of 5 mm clinically and surgically so in that case or every case we need a frozen section or some uh, uh my sir i don't i really don't think you need a frozen section in every case especially when as a surgeon you are pretty confident that you have got an adequate margin uh beyond the induration you have taken a 5 5 uh, uh, mm margin so again about the margins it again depends on the grade on the biopsy if it's a grade 3 tumor you may need to have a, a wider margin that some of the studies state that based on the grade you need to take the need to take the margin but i think uh, as a surgeon your main uh, concern is having a functional uh, functional voiding function that's the most important thing as a surgeon for you but as a margin of penectomy i think every uh, penectomy does not require a frozen section okay so as of now we uh, yeah uh, mahindra with that question? yeah yeah so with that we'll we'll move to the next because uh, we have limited time we'll go to the next speaker and uh, i invite dr philip spees uh, who will be speaking on hpv and penile cancer is it worth exploring for the sir has a uh, tremendous experience on hpv related penile carcinoma and he has numerous papers uh, published in uh, multiple journals so i would like sir to share his uh, experience dr philip are you there dr philip dr philip you have to unmute dr philip you have to unmute yeah sorry i'm just trying to get my uh, yeah dr screen. philip you can start sharing your screen thank you let's see here apologies my computer has been acting up a little bit uh one iphone can you see my screen uh, we can see yes, but there is see. no presentation here you can see your uh, email basically gmail hmm. can yeah you see this right here yeah yeah it's coming up now thank you well first of all it's a uh, you can all see my slides uh, you can make it in the powerpoint yeah sure and Yeah, you're okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very very much for the opportunity to speak to you today and I want to congratulate all the uh all the the society, the USI as well as all the organizers for putting this meeting together. I think it's uh it says a lot about your society to to really um provide a, I think an update and really focus on a cancer which as was mentioned does not unfortunately get much uh research and and really focus as as part of conferences. So again, congratulations to all of you and it's it's a privilege to be among you uh this morning or I guess this afternoon in in India. So I'll be speaking uh briefly on uh on HPV and its role in penile cancer just to briefly go through my disclosures. Uh, I am a member of the NCCN as was mentioned as the vice chair and uh, I have the privilege along with my colleague Dr. Necky on launching a global society is really dedicated to rare genital urinary tumors and and looking forward to to telling you more about that in the in the weeks to come. So let's just delve in a little bit into the molecular pathways of penile cancer. What do we know? I think uh the previous presentation did an excellent job highlighting really that we clearly know um based on the subtypes of penile cancer that the preponderance of HPV association goes up quite dramatically. For example, when you talk about things like bavinoid papillosis, we see an incidence of close to 100% of HPV related tumors. uh when you see things that are preneoplastic like lichen sclerosus we clearly do not see an association and really i think we now have a, a really strong uh i think a level of evidence that probably about 40 to 60% of penile tumors are likely hpv related and was nicely uh depicted earlier uh that is uh, now reflected on on uh, on classifications and it really does reflect other organ systems like for example head and neck tumors for example So this is uh this is a slide that's taken from a, a prior article that was published several years ago and this is a a model uh, that was developed in cervical carcinoma but it really highlights the same type of belief 
and a hypothesis in terms of how HPV impacts penile cancer. HPV causes an infection within the basal cells. And over time, this infection of all the cells results in loss of polarity within the cells themselves. And eventually you get a, a low grade to high grade dysplasia uh, progression. And unfortunately, uh, in many cases, particularly the ones that are infected with what we would say are, are the more highly aggressive subtypes or seroforms of HPV 16 being the, the most common one, we see uh, cancer progression with uh, the ability of cells to uh, be able to metastasize as is highlighted quite well in the, in the bottom diagrams. Well, I think that also provides a, a really a quite a unique opportunity. And I think always, as we're talking about rare cancers, we should talk about where the research is going. And this is a, an example of a technique which is being used more and more in many cancer systems to do multiplex immunohistochemistry. So what ultimately can be done is as this progression happens, uh, we're able to understand what are the drivers of progression and, and ultimately of metastasis. And therefore you could stain for various types of markers as is highlighted here. And then you can really get a really a very significant map of what's happening within the entire interface of the tumor with uh, the uh, host, as well as the interface specifically within the immune and tumor uh, fronts. So again, I, I do think there is uh, some exciting new techniques and technologies which are th sort of highlighting abilities to look at this. I think this is something we had published several years ago with my colleague from Germany, uh, Chris Protzel. And as you see here in the bottom uh, right corner of the, of the slide, this is really the, the, the pathways which are associated with HPV and penile carcinogenesis. You clearly see that this is associated with P16 as we were discussing a few moments ago. And really there's two drivers here, uh, retinoblastoma and P53. I do wanna highlight two important factors because it's going to relate to some uh, studies which I'm gonna discuss with you is the P10 progression through the AKT pathway uh, is, is one which associates itself with the HPV pathway of carcinogenesis. And also P16, as we were just mentioned a few moments ago, is also uh, believed to play a, a strong role. The left part of this slide really re uh, illustrates what we believe are the non-HPV related pathways of penile carcinogenesis, which again, re represent a smaller subset. So this is work that we did a few years ago uh, that was published in the Clinical Genital Urinary Cancer. This is a, based on a tissue microarray of penile cancer of various uh, stages and various subtypes. And what you really ultimately see is that P16 uh, negative tumors have a, have a strong positivity for P53 node positive disease. And when you break it down, uh, being P16 positive was strongly associated with a more favorable outcome. So, uh, and really, as you'll see in the next uh, slide, when you look at it on a multivariate model, you clearly see P16 status and HPV positivity is strongly associated with a more favorable prognosis, probably up to about 30, uh, 70 percent uh, significantly improved overall survival. And things like node status, as we all know, are probably still the strongest uh, predictors of how patients do. And as you see, again, P16 positivity strongly associated, and this has been corroborated on some additional studies as well. How about uh, HPV-16 uh, and HPV, uh, and sorry, P53 association? As I was mentioned earlier, if you're P16 positive, uh, P53 negative, this is the type of curve you're associated with. So we're starting to understand the drivers of, of not only carcinogenesis, but our prognosis, not only from a, a clinical pathological stage, as we were discussing earlier, but also molecular drivers of this pathway. And it, oftentimes, I think the HPV pathway is probably the, the more significantly uh, elucidated versus HPV negative pathways. This is some other work we had published a couple of years ago. I was, I was mentioning P10 is believed to play a strong driver here through the PI3K, AKT progression, and then you see mTORs, uh, something which is of interest. And when you start looking at it in a multivariate model, you see again, same type of factors. You see that nodal stage, HPV positivity, again, strong predictors, of how patients do, but you also start seeing things at the specific uh, molecular pathways of, you know, of HPV that's associated, meaning if you're PS6 uh, negative, you have a much uh, worse prognosis and PAKT uh, negative as well. So we clearly see that these are additional prognostic factors, which uh, probably have some prognostic, but also probably some therapeutic opportunities in the future as we get better and better in, in, in really targeting these pathways. 
As you all know, I think one area that I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about is HPV vaccination. I think that's, that's an area, unfortunately, where there's not much uh, focus, particularly in young males. We talk a lot about it in cervical cancer. We talk a lot about it now for, for head and neck cancer. But as you all know, the FDA approved Gardasil, uh, a HPV vaccine denied by uh, serotypes, and uh, really was, is meant to be for young women of the ages of 9 to 26, as well as young males as well. And uh, people often ask, well, what's the data to support that this has any effect specifically on penile cancer? And I'll just talk to you about one study, which I think led to some significant subsequent ones. Anna Giuliano is a uh, fantastic scientist at my institution at Moffitt, who's really focused her entire career on HPV vaccinations. And really, Anna published this paper in New England Journal, which I think is one of the more uh, pivotal papers in this area. Uh, it's part of a large group of studies called the HIM studies. And uh, Anna was able to nicely show in this study of close to 4,000 young males that HPV vaccination resulted in less external genital uh, lesions associated with HPV. Uh, quite dramatically here, as you see, 36 cases in the vaccinated group versus 89 in a non-vaccinated group. The efficacy of, of the vaccination reducing these lesions was about 65%. As you'd expect, the side effect profile of this has been really quite favorable, only really local pain at the injection site. And really the, the question that resulted from this and subsequent studies is, well, these studies have shown decrease in HPV-related external genital lesions, but what's the, uh, the data support it reduces penile carcinogenesis? And the answer is ultimately we don't have that direct data at this point, but oftentimes the lesions that were identified in this study were HPV-16 positive lesions. So it's felt that probably there is a, some degree of underpowering based on the low uh, name, number of cases of penile cancer that it wasn't necessarily shown, but it's probably felt in a large ecosystem and, and environment where you have a young males that are particularly at risk of getting uh, HPV related cancers, it clearly may have a, an effect on uh, the incidence of this unfortunate cancer, which is preventable. And these are the survival curves. Again, if you look at it in terms of incidence um, of external genital lesions, uh, these are for all serotypes. In the intention to treat analysis, you see quite a dramatic decrease. This is as well seen in the per protocol population. So just a very different way of looking at the data. And when you look specifically at all subtypes of HPV, again, you see a very favorable uh, effect of the vaccination program. This led us to, uh, to do some work and, and write this review a couple of years ago. And uh, this really fits the model. I just want to discuss this very briefly uh, that again, there may be a role clearly of HPV vaccination here in high risk males. But I think uh, the belief that I have that, and I think uh, many others have sort of uh, felt similarly is what if you have patients who have established penile carcinogenesis or preneoplastic lesion, is there a role of the vaccination, for example, to potentiate immune response and affect ultimately generating a subsequently additional, um, I guess, target to HPV and the subsequent uh, uh, progression of the cancer? And actually, this is interesting. This is uh, in a different model. This is in a, a oropharyngeal carcinoma HPV model. And this was published in JAMA Oncology a couple of years ago. It was a phase two study. And what you see here is that um, these are really oropharyngeal carcinomas that are really uh, the most unfavorable of them all, meaning platinum refractory, refractory to uh, targeted therapies, immunotherapy combinations. And really, you see that using a combination of uh, checkpoint inhibitors as well as HPV-related vaccines, they had complete response rates of 12%, 13% in patients where really you see that there's a high progression of propensity for these patients to fail fairly quickly. So there probably is a role for a combination of HPV vaccines in combination with immunotherapy, but I think this is, this is very early in its infancy. And as you all know with immunotherapies is what we do see is that patients who respond can respond for a very pro pronounced uh, duration, sometimes up to five to six years or even longer. And when you do see a response, it could be pretty dramatic in some of these patients with uh, significant uh, tumor regression of these tumors. And uh, this again is, is just to highlight the fact in this study, the uh, overall response rate was about 36%, which is dramatically better uh, than uh, single agent uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So probably more to come on this in this area. Finally, uh, but not least, I just want to highlight again, this is part of an ongoing effort as part of the Global Society of Rare Genitalia Tumors to really focus in this. And uh, we definitely welcome uh, the uh, ISU additional members uh, to participate with us as we embark on, on, on understanding and, and treating these cancers and improving patient outcomes ultimately in the years to come. 
And this is, uh, again, uh, I have the privilege of having Dr. Prakash on our governing council. And again, we welcome to work with the ISU uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, talk, Dr. Philip. Uh, we are honored to hear, listen to you and the amount of work you have done on uh, HPV related uh, penile cancer and uh, the associated treatment with that. So uh, we have one question for you. What is the reason for the EGL in individuals who have received the vaccine and does the virus undergo mutation? Will, we, will there be a role for immunotherapy since many advances are happening in the field of translational medicine and molecular markers in carcinoma penis? You want me so, to repeat? Or? No, I, I, I got okay. it. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. So I, I think that that's an excellent question. So I think the question related to why would you get external genital lesions in the vaccinated group? And the, the, the truth of the matter is it's probably not well understood, but trauma and uh, recurrent infection is probably a strong prop uh, proponent to it. Um, there definitely is also some, some new data to suggest <laughs> probably some, some cross-infective uh, nature to having uh, infection with various subtypes of HPV. And I will tell you, even to this day, we're identifying new subtypes of HPV. And there probably is some factor of synergistic effect that you can have uh, infection with certain subtypes, which may not be necessarily the vaccinated groups. So probably a little bit more to come on that. And in terms of the immunotherapeutics, I definitely think that's that's an exciting area. We didn't really talk about uh, PDL one, which is a, I think a very interesting area. Clearly, we do know that about thirty to forty percent of penile cancers probably have PDL one positivity. So all of it lends itself to the role of immunotherapies. And uh, as as many of you know, the problem with penile cancer is tumor mutational burden seems to be fairly low, although that varies from uh, patient to patient. So I, I think probably we're we're leaning towards an area where it's going to be a combination of immunotherapies with uh, targeted vaccines. And I think HPV is probably a, a very unique and highly targetable area just because of that. Excellent, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and we would uh, like to go to the next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, Mahindra, you can invite the next speaker. Mahindra. So uh, from the nice talk about the pathological aspect of penile cancer, now we go towards the, some clinical uh, aspects and the uh, most controversial thing in this uh, uh, area is uh, which cross-sectional imaging to be done in penile cancer. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Raghunath, uh, sir. Uh, he's a chief oncologist and a head of department uh, of oncology in SCG Hospital, Bangalore. Raghunath, sir, please take over. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Mahendra. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gagan. Very good evening to all of you. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, USI and uh, ISU for this opportunity. Uh, my talk is about when to order which cross-sectional and nuclear imaging. So I would address my talk under these settings. Role of MRI in deciding whether to go for partial, total penectomy, or any penile preservation is possible or not. Any reliable imaging is there for non-palpable nodes versus what is best for palpable nodes and what is best for metastatic evaluation. So. I would like to tell at the beginning of my talk, there are no RCTs comparing between various modalities at various stages. So basically I would be talking on which is better, which imaging is better for T-staging, which is better for N-staging and M-staging. Coming to role of MRI for T-staging in deciding partial or total penectomy or whether we can consider penile preservation. Again, there are no RCTs. I would like to take you through whatever is available in the literature, particularly EAU guidelines and NCCN guidelines. When it comes to MRI for staging, this is the normal penile imaging, MR imaging. You can make out very well the corporal bodies, urethra. You can completely make out the full length of the urethra. So the spatial resolution is definitely better compared to CT scan and PET CT scan. So this is considered now as standard of care for evaluation of Stage, uh, staging to you know make you understand better in what way MRI is superior to CT scan. I will take you through these images. This you can make out carcinoma of the glans penis, the hypointense mass in the glans without involvement of the carporal bodies. However, you can also see a left inguinal node which is picked up on this uh, with a similar intensity. The sensitivity and specificity of MRI in predicting the corporal invasion is about uh, 82% and 73% respectively. 
and when it comes to the urethral invasion it is slightly less it is 62 and 82% here again you can make out a glans lesion infiltrating the corpora without involvement of the urethra you can make out here it is infiltrating the corporal bodies but urethra is spared you can also make out the distance from the tumor to the root of the penis it is sufficiently long enough so that you can decide whether you can consider partial penectomy or uh, uh, total penectomy here it is possible to go for partial penectomy another imaging large high pointed tumor mass in the glands extending to the shaft you can make out here the mass is extending to the shaft with infiltration of the both corpora and even the urethra you can make out the dilatation of the urethra is in proximal to the infiltration of the urethra you can also make out the mass is extending almost very close to the root of the penis here probably it is very difficult to consider a uh, partial penectomy you have may have to consider a uh, radical penectomy so with this we can understand that mri is a good imaging modality for the staging when it comes to the imaging of the non nodes this i've taken directly from the eau guidelines if nodes are non palpable the likelihood of having microscopic mets is around 25% the imaging studies are not very helpful when clinically n0 nodes are there when you don't palpate any nodes probably imaging is not going to be very useful but it may be useful in some situations like whenever obese patients you can't palpate those nodes in such cases probably you can utilize either ultrasound 7.5 or 10 mega scope or you can probably utilize even mri to locate the nodes uh in uh, some literature support is there when you identify longitudinal and transverse diameter ratio and absence of the uh, you know uh, hilum is very uh, full of fat probably it's suggestive of uh, uh, non suggestive of uh, tumor uh, tumor infiltration of the nodes uh, the conventional ct and mr cannot detect microscopic metastasis reliably and fdg pet ct also does not detect lymphoid metastasis if the size of the lymph node is less than 10 mm so when it comes to imaging of the non palpable nodes probably imaging is not very reliable and it is not very useful but there is a role of ultrasound in this situation you can make out from the top left hand side image this is a normal inval node where homogeneous hypoechoic cortex is seen with intact contour and hyperechoic hilum is seen hyperechoic hilum means it is not infiltrated probably by the tumor here you can make out another example the node is enlarged with eccentric cortical hypertrophy suggestive of metastasis another example of enlarged node with loss of hyperechoic hilum which is again suggestive of metastasis so we can probably utilize ultrasound if the nodes are very small if clinically not palpable when it comes to the palpable inval nodes again eu guidelines says palpably enlarged nodes are highly indicative of metastasis a pelvic ct or mri sorry sorry for that a pelvic ct or mri scan is very helpful to assess the pelvic lymph nodes because you expect pelvic lymph nodes whenever pal grossly palpable no inval nodes are uh, seen in patient with palpable inval nodes fdg has very high sensitivity uh, of confirming the metastasis the sensitivity is almost close to 100% it is 88 to 900% and when it comes to specificity it's close to 100% whereas in indian scenario whether we can utilize pet ct when primary is there with lot of infection we really do not know probably after uh, partial penectomy if nodes are positive probably you can utilize fdg pet ct in palpable inval nodes so to conclude from this ct and mr are recommended whereas pet ct is definitely superior to ct and mr with better sensitivity and specificity when it comes to the distant metastasis uh, systemic metastasis evaluation uh, is required only if inval nodes are positive if inval nodes are not positive uh, probably you, you don't need uh, metastatic evaluation the abdominal and pelvic ct plus chest x ray is recommended by eau guidelines however chest x ray has inferior sensitivity so ct chest is definitely better than ct x ray i mean chest x ray uh, eau 2020 guidelines suggest that pet ct is an option probably because of its higher sensitivity and specificity pet ct is an option so conclusion from this is ct abdomen and chest is recommended whenever grossly palpable nodes are positive and when you expect metastasis fdg pet ct is an option with better sensitivity and specificity this is the eau guidelines already i have discussed i will not go into the details of this 
when it comes to nccn guidelines nccn guidelines do not talk about either ct or mr or pet ct it just tells about whenever non palpable inguinal lymph nodes are there cross sectional imaging of the chest abdomen and pelvis is required whenever non bulky inguinal nodes are there again cross sectional imaging of chest abdomen and pelvis when it comes to the metastatic evaluation again they don't comment much on this again cross sectional imaging of the chest abdomen and pelvis they don't discriminate that the ct is better than mr or pet ct for definitely for local staging mr is better for nodal and metastatic uh, evaluation either ct or pet ct could be considered so uh, this one article i could come across review article on the role of pet ct in uh, penile cancer uh, published in 2017 uh, fdg pet ct the conclusion from this is exact role of pet ct remains again on the years uh, may be useful in assessing pelvic and occult distant meds prior to systemic chemotherapy and prior to an extensive surgical resection this definitely improves the selection of patient likely to benefit from an aggressive multimodal therapy whether this multimodal therapy is required in penile cancer in such situation that question remains unanswered so to conclude from all these is for t staging probably mri is superior for non palpable nodes no imaging is very useful probably we could consider ultrasound in obese patients for palpable nodes ct mr is okay for pet ct is definitely superior with its better sensitivity and specificity for m staging either ct of the abdomen and chest or fdg pet ct could be utilized thank you uh, thank you ragnar sir it's a nice talk uh, there is a one question uh, for you uh, what is the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound in n0 nodes uh, ultrasound is very highly subjective it is difficult to say it depends on the uh radiology it depends on the type of probe and the resolution of the probe it is somewhere around uh, uh, 50 to 60% it is not very sensitive yeah it's depend on the uh, the person who is doing that how much experience yes. he has in that yes uh sir can i, just, I have a... uh, can i just add something mahendra roy and uh, yeah, yeah. The dr ragnar's permission yes, sir. sir um i think as stand alone most of us we would not want to do an ultrasound and you know totally rely on it but i think the uh, protocols of yeah yeah the, protocol, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the protocols of dynamic sentinel lymph nodes uh, are now more and more of them are including as a yes. part of uh, that you know so other things yeah. plus ultrasound so you have yeah, to depend on your yes go ahead sir go ahead sir please yeah so you have to whenever non palpable nodes are there probably you do dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy it depends on the histology you proceed you don't depend on uh, heavily on uh, imaging for non palpable nodes yeah so for uh, one of our studies sir uh, for n0 nodes of case lnb we had done uh, ultrasound also as you said the sensitivity specificity is around in the range of 50% and whatever the previous study also we had seen it is around 50% only so, uh, so there is not much of role in the n0 you depend on the correct okay. basically you depend on the histology of the primary and sentinel lymph node biopsy Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So we'll go to the next, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Ganesh Bakshi, who is a professor of urology at Tata Memorial Hospital. In uh, in uh, introduction, because he is very well known amongst the urology crowd, and he is going to give a talk, on surgery and beyond. Over to you, sir. Uh, you can start. Your, yeah, uh, thank you, Rakesh and Mahendra. Uh, yeah. uh, I thank the USI office bearers and ISU office bearers as well as the moderators of this session. In eye preserving techniques, surgery and beyond was the topic. So, what we do traditionally was a macroscopic 20 mm margin and usually offered penile amputation with excellent oncologic controls. versus uh, we used to have a high physical or a psychosexual morbidity and the uh, literature which has evolved has got us to a less uh, bigger margin like grade 1 3 mm and grade 2 5 and grade 3 8 mm margin and this paved the way for a confidence in offering penile preserving strategies with a safe oncological outcome so the rationale here is actually uh, we can make a final penis which is capable of maturating and possibly good sexual functions lessens the psychosocial impact uh, but the local recurrence should not be adversely affected 
and it helps in penile cancer because usually the skip regions are rare so we should be sure of a tumor stage that we are dealing with a early stage cancer a very good clinical examination is needed and in equivocal cases as dr raghunath just mentioned we can make judicious use of available imaging so what are the surgical options they depend on the tumor factors location stage as well as some of the patient factors age comorbid status impact of loss of penile length and absolutely in all cases a com good compliance of patient is needed uh, the first one of the simplest surgery circumcision a therapeutic for a solely preposterous lesion preventive role in those with tis of the glands also and removes hpv favorable environment yet there is a local recurrence rate of 15 to 50% in all the reported studies the next glands uh, surfacing which can be total or a partial again obviously for smaller lesions as the diagram also shows in total all epithelium and subepithelium is excised a perimetal circumcoronal margin is left behind and a split thickness skin graft can be aptly put in partial the same thing can be done but it should uh, the lesion should involve less than 50% of the glands and if you see the recurrence rate is very low in case of recurrence easy therapy second therapy can be given and the cancer specific rates are really good uh, the simplest other surgery wide local excision for lesions up to t1a may be done on the glands also like a partial glandectomy maybe closed by primary closure or a skin graft or a flap skin perpetual anything is possible uh, this is about glandectomy the next procedure uh, t1b or even some t2 tumors confined to the glands uh, usually we take a circumcoronal incision glands is separated from the corporal heads nicely the urethra is dissected we can have a frozen section if available and a new meters is fashioned so again the cancer specific survival rates are good there are a few complication rates graft failure or graft stenosis uh, in some cases urethral stenosis now uh, partial penectomy as a mode of organ sparing this is what is the most commonly done surgery the new margin recommendations would definitely allow to preserve a longer shaft of the penis often the length preserved is adequate for micturition but not for the sexual function and there are options for penile lengthening which should be adopted divide the suspensory ligament division of the penis total web horizontally and suturing it vertically and suprapubic pad of fat excision so again excellent oncological outcomes about 3/4 can achieve an erection but many have poor sexual function the recurrence and the cancer specific survivals are excellent uh, this is about laser therapy for lesions up to t1 but has been reported in some t2 cases also so basic two types of laser have been described co2 laser and diag laser in literature and very few reports about holmium laser and they have gone good studies again uh, there is a recurrence rate up to 10 to 26% in co2 laser and variable in the ndiac laser so studies have even reported a combined use of both the lasers uh, there was one option which i have totally left behind is a mohs micrographic surgery which has been in the literature in uh, journals reported and nobody does right now i have not heard any uh, urologist doing it right now so but non surgical therapy it's topical uh, five fluorouracil which acts by inhibiting the thymidylate synthase leading to dna damage and imikimod which activates toll like receptors and the response rates in five five few is 57% and 62% in imikimod so the non response should suggest presence of more invasive disease and should be treated with surgical option ebrt for selected lesions up to t1 and infrequently t2 with the patient supine penis is supported vertically in a mold and a radiation dose of 66 to 70 is given it's a good local control rate 40 to 70% over 5 years and local failures would be treated with salvage excision interstitial hdr breaky is a better option it's the right technique under anesthesia in dwelling foley's a dose of 45 to 51 grays over 7 8 days would be given there is a very good penile preservation rate of 70 to 80% so in follow up importance should be emphasized right in the beginning patient should be taught self examination and most recurrences it is very important that these happen in the first two years and in the first five years what to do in case of a recurrence uh, topical therapy should not be repeated 
failures after radiation can be managed by surgeries if t2 disease on recurrence a partial or a total phenectomy is advisable so important to say this is a penile preserving strategies resection margins as uh, oncologically safe as per the grade of the cancer local recurrences do not affect overall survival hence these strategies can be done in selected patients recurrences happen another attempt at penile preserving in very select cases not all penile preservation has a positive psychological and functional impact and follow up patient compliance is an essential pillar in this therapy thank you so much excellent presentation sir and thank you to be on time so uh since there are no questions i would like to ask you one question sir sir how uh, do you uh, means confirm the recurrences because post radiation generally which is less now uh, the radiation been given to the primary but even after the, uh, the surgery part the clinical examination is very uh, not confirmation so how so how very good clinical examination i think a suspicion on basis of your experience and secondly we can always have a penile scrape cytology or then a straight forward biopsy where it's feasible and needed that would be my answer and uh, you should have a low low suspicion so whenever there is a chance you should go for a biopsy as early as possible okay absolutely low suspicion i mean you should pay good attention to the local examination that way and you need a very good urologist right so you recommend a mri to be done because there is continuously a question being asked in the chat box uh, prior for to for smaller going. lesions i don't think mri is needed at all many times just an examination is okay but if you are doubtful about some uh, involvement which would not give you a penile preserving like a partial glenectomy and you will need a partial penectomy you can do a high frequency probe sonography and rule out your uh, doubt okay. mri would be more over in slightly different things as dr raghunath has showed where the mri applicability is much better there are no questions uh, from the rest of the speakers so we can uh, go to the next uh, next talk thank you very much thank uh, you so for much. your talk sir uh, Mahindra, you can invite the next speaker. Mahindra, are you there? Mahindra, unmute. Yeah, yeah. So the next uh, speaker for this session is a uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay uh, Pandey. He uh, doesn't need uh, an introduction, as he's a vast experience uh, and uh, he's a big name in uh, uh, andrology and reconstruction uro uh, urology. So, and he is a, a consultant uh, and HOD of uh, andrology and reconstruction urology in Gagarin Hospital. So, I invite uh, Dr. Sanjay Pandey to deliver a lecture on. A long-term functional outcome, urinary and sexual after penectomy. Sanjay, sir. Yes, Dr. Mahindra. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Dr. Rakesh, uh, Dr. Gagan, the entire uh, team of teachers who actually head this entire program today, USI, ISU, respected audience. I think it's important for us to look at long-term functional outcomes uh, post-total penectomy from teen reasons, both urinary and sexual, after we have actually completed our act and got ourselves into a situation where we don't have an oncological reference. So why did somebody so young or not so young got a malignancy? He got it, and then the luminaries in the audience treated him. They looked at the best of it. But post penile preservation surgery, as wonderfully demonstrated by Dr. Ganesh Bakshi in the last presentation, we will look at the long-term issues in this men who got to lead a life which is uh, out of this into rehabilitation for urinary and sexual. We look at that. With all the on oncological outcomes secured, and we have got data, and we've got the measurements done, and we looked at there are no recurrences. Comes anxiety, the anguish, the agony, the dilemma, desperation, and discontent. Why? After having been in the worry of oncological recurrence, which has not happened for six months, one year, two years, that the team of urologists, urologists, pathologists, and the team looked at, comes the urinary and sexual issues. Then in mind, they're still very young. If they're not young, that they are not so young. still young in their mind and heart so we look at this larger aspect of their outcomes and capabilities in the prime of their life on two important aspects and both important aspects deserve to be looked into which we could do much better if we could look at the outcomes much earlier in life uh, looked at them counsel and thought about them because urinary and sexuality both governed by a single organ as given to us for our man in question who we did good could have either warding dysfunction or sexual dysfunction so let's get into this picture by understand in our handicaps and the outcomes that we have the outcomes that we look at on the oncological aspects are wonderful and they have been standardized they have taken to very highest level but we may look at the handicap in outcomes in urinary and sexual issues and short and long terms the short term is quite marred only because we are looking at 
the patient, the relatives, and us all looking at preventing recurrence and maintaining the, the health of the body in terms of no oncological uh, disproportion. But when it comes to outcomes in urinary and sexual issues, let me look at the entire data which emanates over the last 15 years, this lack of standardization. There's so much of retrospective work which has been done, which has actually been published, with measured tools which actually sway between A to Z. There's so much of sway in the way they have been measured around. And rightly, all of them have stretched themselves on oncological angle, rightly so, which is required. But long-term follow-ups when we look at on the urinary and sexual issues are quite missing because the oncological follow-up has even been talked about 10 years. When we look at post-10 years discussion on retrospect, we look at two to five years data where they talk about many good, significant, but when you look at the real data, it's quite small. So let's look at that. A patient were given a chance to address their concerns beyond our successes on the quality of the issues that emanate. The handicaps would not have been what we find today. Let's also go to where does the data come from? The data comes from countries where the disease is labeled as rare, 1% of entire malignancy. They stretch over long years of work between luminaries, but have a limited follow. Oncological safety was never compromised by any of the teams who have published data. As the stress has always been on recurrent prevention, and that has played on everybody's mind. And finally, one fine day, we wake up to that. Let's go to some data which is available to us. And we went to 2018 and looked at the topic given to me, sexual and warding outcomes in post penile patients, partial and total. We looked at this important knowledge where um, the group from United States of America talked about, to our knowledge, there's the largest assessment of sexual and urinary function using standardized validated questionnaires. Let me move forward. The, the result was the largest assessment of urinary and sexual forward function till 2018 in post penectomy partial penectomy status were only eight patients. 2004 to 2014, 10 years. In 10 years, only eight patients were looked into in details. Something which Dr. Tangankar, Dr. Ganesh, Dr. Yoraja, Dr. Gagan would possibly do in a week or maybe in a month in the kind of disease processes that we have. And it was talked about mild to moderate dysfunction after 10 years of work and oncological follow-up on the results that they looked at. Let's move to 2018 again and stretch ourselves from Germany to Mexico and look at the result of health-related quality of life and sexual function of these patients. It talked about post-penectomy, sexual function was severely affected in patients treated with partial penectomy, something which we just heard in the first while lectures. Let's move forward to the so-called Bible of Urology, the J-Urol, and we look at a data from 2017. Organ sparing surgery for penile cancer, a systematic review. When you look at that, the last sentence talks about many patients were able to urinate while standing and a significant number were able to have intercourse. What were the numbers? It's possibly the paper on. There's so few numbers of them. Let's look at sexual medicine, the, the Bible of sexual medicine, and look at data which comes from no less than Scarberry, Angermeyer, Montagu, Campbell, and Wood. So the, the leaders on combining andrology with oncology. And we look at 50 patients identified by hospital billing records who underwent surgery from 2003 to 2012. So cases where between those nine to 10 years, 50 patients, they went back in 2012 and looked at all these 50 patients. How did they do the record and survey? By telephonic conversations. Only six patients out of 50 fulfilled the criteria of organ sparing surgery and outcomes. Three patients report normal erections. That means half report normal erections. Part is not enjoyable and they're dissatisfied in sexual outcomes. Six report urinary symptoms. That means all six report urinary symptoms. That's 100 percent report urinary symptoms. Decreased stream to 67 percent incomplete warding. 80 percent patients report their sexual symptoms are not interfering with their daily life. How frequently are they active? In their 40s to 50s, they are active only once in two months to once in six months. 100 percent report satisfied with their procedure. What procedure was that? What were they satisfied with? The result was this. So we're looking at the data. We're waking up to the phenomena that. We have got people who have been doing partial penectomies, the results, the cosmesis, which we can leave for a while, but we look at the functionality of the organ, both in terms of warding and in terms of sexuality. And look at the parachute technique, which comes from Brazil. It talks about the appearance of penises back to the days of phimosis. No, no, no worries on that, but we look at this large picture of data, which comes in, and there's so much to actually quote around. We look at where does the data come from? So where should the data come from? The data should come from here. Why? Because six weeks ago in the SARC summit, we all heard approximately 48 to 50 percent of CAPNS is from the SARC countries. The number in innovations have come from here, and people have actually brandished the best of the techniques to look at both penile preservation over the last one decade, more so in Tata Memorial and other important oncological hospitals where people have looked at both the angles together. Where does India stand? India stands at 5.1 inch. What does it mean? 5.1 inches is the average penile length 
of an Indian male. We are far behind the winners. The winner takes it all. Sudan, Congo, Cameroons, these all have got the length where if you sacrifice something, you're still enough to manage. If you sacrifice 5.08 centimeters smaller penis than the leaders, what are you left with? You left with something maybe much smaller. The organ which was called in our teaching and learning days as serviceable organ may not be serviceable both in the washroom as well as in, as well as in the bed. Let's look at a young patient whom I operated three days ago. 31 years young male uh, in Mumbai, an assistant general manager. He was married one year ago. He has a progressive onset glands lesion and he is also a diabetic. He was applying creams of all kinds, yellow and white. He was incapable in bed and also with his partner in the office too. And finally, we drop him a bombshell. This is Kasama penis. Where does he go? He goes into a partial penectomy status. Did we ever ask him questions? What happens to your sexuality? You're incapable in both the locations where you could be capable of. and Your, your sexuality will go away dramatically. So these are the kind of patients we get through. India and SARC countries have the data and the wherewithal and obviously the techniques and the capability which we heard around. So what does one need to do? Assess him and his partner preoperatively, helping him to counsel him to navigate the post-operative phase both on the very scare of malignancy, why me, and take him forward to the important issue. Is he a lemon on toothpick, an Indian phenomenon in 50s, 60s, or is he not one in his 30s? Many of them have got buried penis and we know that by MRI studies, we know that a lot of shaft in Indian men could be hidden down in the buried area of the perineum and, and the penis location. Does he have a BX zone and lichen changes? Recent studies have talked about BX zone lichen actually existing and re coming, coming back on the neometers, which we would do after partial parenchyma. What would he leave with? You will leave him with that very important large data, which came in 2018, where he'll have a splayed stream and a metal stenosis. So you should counsel him deep about the re reconstruction. The reconstruction you do at the time of oncological surgery could be different. But beyond the surveillance period of close to one to two years, depending on the malignancy, tell him all is not lost. Go back to your oncological team and they have a man in between them who actually looks at the andrological aspect of oncology. So it's all is not lost is what we need to tell them. You got to take them forward to the highest possible level. Let's look at somebody who underwent a partial penectomy and is crippled in both urinary and sexual issues. I do the skip flap and the prior flap for all males who require and are needy for the organ, which couldn't be the ap epispadias and hyperspadias cripples. And obviously that is a take from the gender reassignment assignment surgery for the last 10 years that we've done here out here. So we could take them forward, give them an organ, give them some sensuality, give them Dr. Shah's processes and give them an aspect of it. Coming to an end, if the small is a new normal for him and that is going to be permanent for him, it is important to do a wonderful pre-operative counseling before you break the news. Always involve the partner and get to know a lot about it. It's important to know whether he's actually sexually active. He may be in 40s, 50s, given up sexual activity. We need to know his frequency. We need to know what does sexual and urinary issue mean to him post his surgery, which Dr. Ganesh Bakshi enlisted so well that he does around all the time. So we need to look at continued balance on oncological safety, which is primary aim of this meeting. And for all of us in the audience, we have all techniques towards long-term organ rehab as he comes out of the oncological surveillance whenever he comes out of the jail. Finally, urinary stream should not be splaying and stenos. His sexual capabilities should also be discussed with the capabilities from the partner side who actually are not ashamed and who tell the truth and we use tools to understand them. And finally, for all the colleagues in today's audience, someone in the oncological team surely has an andrological and reconstructive bend of the mind. And he could do wonders to the re-reconstruction as and when required. As I come to a close, the future is about thinking out of the box. It is from this place that it emanates so much. So why not India today? The good news issue is, we have done a life-saving surgery him, on him by a partial penectum. Let's do a life-changing, life-extending, life-modifying treatment for these needy patients, bringing them back to active and fuller lives is what could be the motor in long term, if not the short term. And therefore, the long term is about need to address issues under the undergarments and the pants on both urinary and sexual issues. And that's when we'll get 100% success, what both the patient and the partner and the doctor looks at. Finally, it's truly a challenge in a dream. It's a story of human ambition, the ambition across the table. We need to look at reincarnating ourselves when we look at this kind of a topic. Thank you so much for selecting this. Thank you, Gagan, and the entire team for inviting. Mahindra, are you there? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, thank you, Sanjay. It's a very wonderful talk and very informative for all of us. There's a one question. Uh, what is the functional outcome of reconstructed penises? Wonderful question. So in a male who gets a penis back, please uh, understand that he had an organ before. He had a wonderful organ before, which was functional and capable. That organ goes away and becomes non-functional for all practical purposes. 
that he was capable of. Now to give him another organ after a partial penectomy or to make him learn from the residual organ is not an easy task. Therefore, a lot of mind and body games and therefore counseling and counseling and counseling. A lot of that goes by a partner who helps it. Finally, uh, we do a lot of patients who come with partial penectomy status with buried shaft where we do a penile lengthening and also a phalloplast. The long-term results are, I would say long-term results after 10 years. I'm only six years in the subject, 10 years into gender reassignment surgery. But when I look at the long-term outcomes on the satisfaction part, after we have put Shah's processes, they're capable enough and their partners tell the story. The partners tell the truth because men can ejaculate. Their capabilities to ejaculate and, and uh, uh, are still good because both it has been seen on long-term studies that the thermal and the vibratory capacities of ejaculation does not go down in partially amputated penis. So it's extremely important for us to look at their organs are capable. The sensation at the tip of the penis, which I create by skip flap or by prior flap, is not the world's best compared to glance, which was hypersensate. And therefore, we, uh, we mellow the results down by keeping it capable and safe, not let the penile processes of Shah's processes come out. So we are good enough at this point in time. We are better off than what we were 10, 20 years ago. And I think colleagues in the audience and teams probably would take it to much higher level than times to. Thank you very much, sir. Rakesh? Uh, so we'll go to the next talk. Uh, it is going to be delivered by Dr. Gagan Prakash, who is a professor of uh, urology at Tata Memorial Hospital and the convener for this program. So Gagan is going to talk on the best way to address N0 growing global practices. Over to you, Gagan. Thanks, Rakesh. The slide is seen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now that we have heard the diversity of managing the penile primary, let's move to the nodes. Now, this uh, whole issue of uh, N0 groin or N0, uh, you know, how to handle the N0 is not new to oncology. And uh, there's been a problem in head and neck cancers, breast, vulva, melanoma, and penile. And essentially, we want to have a balance between the oncological efficacy and the treatment complications. Now, for oncological efficacy for N0 in penile essentially uh, means having the least amount of false negatives, whereas the treatment morbidity is essentially reducing the grade 3, clavin into grade 3 and higher uh, complication rate. Sometime earlier in this decade, EAU uh, mentioned that, you know, there has to be a restratification whenever a decision has to be taken about addressing the groins. And this is what most of us follow. And... Uh, what EA says, the EA guideline says is that anybody with more than T1, G2 disease, that is either intermediate or high risk disease, should under, undergo a bilateral modified inguinal lymphadenectomy or a dynamic sentinel node biopsy. Now let's look at what is happening, you know, what are the options when we have an intermediate or a high risk patients. Uh, essentially, you know, this is from a very recent uh, Nature Reviews uh, article and uh, you know, let's look at the three options. The first one is the DSNB. The second one is a surgical staging. And the third one, which is probably the most recent, is the hybrid uh, technique of DSNB using technetium and uh, ICG. Now, sorry. Yeah. So let's look at the evidence for DSNB. Now with DSNB, there have been some uh, good large series, you know, even single or two centers collaborating to have a series like 500 inguinal basins. And these have been published in uh, reputed journals. We have publications in general of clinical oncology and European urology. And largely these are from, uh, uh, you know, a very high volume center in Netherlands, the Netherlands Cancer Institute, and from the UK group. The same group has recently kind of evolved on the hybrid technique where they're using ICG with technetium. They started, uh, you know, the, the first publication was sometime in 2018. And very recently in the virtual EAU, uh, the Netherlands Cancer Institute group uh, led by uh, Professor Brower has uh, presented the data of 400 uh, intermediate and high risk purely N0 groins. And what this found that the combination of technetium with ICG was actually far better than technetium with blue dye. And they say that it actually improved the optical detection rate of sentinel nodes to almost 38% better than the blue dye. They've concluded that, uh, you know, ICG and uh, technetium should be the way forward. 
Uh, what would we say is that the hot and green is probably a better combination than hot and blue. Now let's come to the option which uh, you know most of us are kind of more familiar with, which is the surgical option. You know the uh, uh, the addressing the groin with inguinal lymph node dissection. Now, when you look at this, this is very recent from Nature Reviews. There are two things which kind of surprised me. One was the terminology. It said superficial modified inguinal lymphadenectomy. The second thing is that it says that the sensitivity and false negative rates are not widely reported. If you look about DSNB, they've been mentioned as 12 to 15 percent. In some series, actually, they've been reported as less than 5 percent also. But over here, this is what has been mentioned about uh, the invasive staging. So I, I was digging into the archives and seeing what's happening to the evidence. You know, Journal of Urology, 1996, a series of 12 patients describing a modified inguinal lymph dissection. British Journal of Urology, 1997, nine patients. Then later, again in Journal of Urology, there was a series of 150 patients, but there was a problem with the terminology. It said modified technique of radical inguinal lymphadectomy, but what was described in the paper was actually a much uh, wider template. Also, the cohort included not just N zeros but some N pluses also. So there is actually, I would say, a lack of evidence for inguinal lymph node dissection, uh, possibly because a lot of historical data which has smaller numbers, variations in the nomenclature and terminology, and the confusion related to the template of MILD and SILD. So let's see what's happening in the two worlds. You know, so there is one world which is essentially following the surgical staging which i believe is a lot of uh, uh, america uh, a lot of most centers in india and asia and they do an inguinal lymph node dissection the problem is that we have poor evidence from scattered data and lack of standardization and terminology with this operation whereas dsnb largely comes from two or three very very high volume centers which have a centralized system you know all penile cancer drains to the centers and they've been able to generate a stronger evidence uh, you know and and larger larger series so what's with this template we discussed about these templates so essentially modified inguinal lymph node dissection is when we have a four to five centimeter smaller incision and we don't go lateral to the femoral artery we don't go caudal to the uh, fossa ovalis whereas when we talk about a superficial inguinal lymph node dissection, which has been classically described as one where you include all the nodes or all the fibro fatty tissue, which is superior to the facial data. So obviously it is going to have a wider template and you are going to get more no lymph nodes, but at the cost of a longer in or a bigger incision. Now we can understand this whole philosophy. If you look at the title of this, you know, another uh, presentation from the same group, it says removing the nodes that count rather than counting the nodes that don't. Very meaningful, removing the nodes that count rather than counting the nodes that don't. And that is what the aim is. This graph shows that the more the number of nodes we remove, the more likely is the complications. And that's what we are supposed to create a balance. Now, let me don the hat of, you know, say a public health, uh, 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 public health personnel from a low medical, low med middle uh, income class country uh, or even from, say, uh, a representative for the newly formed uh, Global Society of Rare Gene Cancers. So let's see what's happening in the N0 groin management in countries where it most matters. If you look at the incidence, then, uh, you know, most of the Western worlds, the incidence are in actually decimals per 100,000. But, you know, the higher the non-developed countries, particularly Brazil, and you can see India also in the list, is where it ranges from 1 to around 7 per 100,000. Let's take a snapshot of what are the things in Brazil where the incidence is actually the highest. Uh, it says that the average time to treatment for these penal cancer patients there is around 18 months. The histological grades are in more than 80% of the patients, they are grade 2 or 3. There's T2 disease in 84% of patients and more than 40% of patients have lymphadenopathy at the time of admission. This is from, uh, I believe this data is from US and what it says is that uh, across different kind of institutes, either the, uh, uh, you know, the government hospitals or the private setups, the utilization or the usage of uh, surgical staging for inguinal lymph node is still around 30 to 40%. percent i this was last captured from 2014. I'm not sure if the things have changed after that, but clearly if you don't stage the lymph nodes properly, you are going to compromise on the oncological outcomes which are happening. 
Something similar was again presented in uh, virtual EAU 2020 this year, and they looked at the variation in inguinal lymph node management by penile cancer specialists, and they found that across Europe, this is a part of the EU Eurogen survey, and they found that actually there was a vast variation in the way the nodes are uh, managed by different centers. Uh, do I have a little time, uh, Rakesh, or I'm almost done? You're hello? just, hello? Yeah. Yeah, almost time is up, Kagan. You have to okay, okay. So I'll just quickly, I'll, I'll just quickly say that you know at at TMH we are trying to look at our data uh, of you know from 2013 to 2019 we've had around 157 patients purely clinically N0 and more than 85 or close to 80 to 85 percent of them have been high risk. Another 12 to 13 percent of these have been intermediate risk. We've captured and tried to see how many of uh, different uh, primary surgeries have happened and what is the kind of incision which has been used. Uh, basically, at different time frames, you know, the earlier we were doing SILD for uh, most of our patients, and then later we switched to a smaller template, and we were trying to look at the complications and the false negatives for the, the two uh, templates. Um, I would just want to say that, uh, you know, as is intuitive, in SILD, the complications were more. That was because, uh, you know, there's a larger incision, you're removing more lymph nodes. The overall false negatives that we are getting is somewhere close to less than 10%. I wouldn't go into the details of uh, you know, how they are different in SILD and MILD, but the recurrences were actually more in the MILD template compared to SILD. This is something that we need to uh, you know, further look into. So the missing links in N0 management is we need to have a standardization of the nomenclature and the template uh, you know, across the globe. The oncological efficacy of MILD and SILD should be well known. And I think we should look at factors beyond the T and G. So, you know, the entire decision right now is taking on the risk stratification, which is based on T and G. And earlier, uh, you know, in uh, Dr. Menon's talk and later on, so we've seen that there are probably other factors. There's LVI, which is a factor. There's PNI, which is a factor. Possibly the tumor size have never been explored. You know, uh, how's the contact surface area of the tumor, uh, you know, with the penile shaft? I, I think there could be more factors. And maybe even the choice of template could be uh, governed by a better uh, or I would say tailored uh, risk classification uh, and with, with the aim of reducing the complications. And once we've kind of standardized all this, I think there's definitely a role to find, uh, you know, between DSNB versus MILD, SILD, which is good. But I think that has to be a global initiative because, uh, you know, there are centers which have gone par excellence on DSNB, where others were for, for whom MILD, SILD is the standard. And I'm sure the uh, the the rare GU uh, society, the global society for rare GU cancers, uh, rare GU tumors, is going to provide us opportunity. And I'm sure uh, you know USI would be supportive in uh, in these endeavors in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So excellent talk again. And uh, as you said, there is ongoing uh, research going on how to manage these zero groins. Uh, still there is uh, discrepancies among uh, each centers so we all have to come together and come to some because it's a rare disease so not practice at all the center which are members should collaborate together and come to some conclusions so uh, are there any questions uh, from any of the speakers uh, we have one question for you what's the practice at uh, tmh uh, uh, for clinically negative nodes kagan yeah so, uh, you know, for we had been practicing actually the SILD template. Can you hear is, me, Gagan? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Akesh? Yeah. yeah. So we, yeah, had yeah, been, yeah. Sorry, we had been practicing the SILD template, which is removing all the nodes which are above the fascia letter. Uh, we have used uh, different incisions for this template. You know, we earlier used a lazy S incision because it gave us the advantage of going into the pelvis also. Later, we switched to a transverse incision, which was a longer transverse incision. Uh, and we realized that there was a lot of complication happening with an SILD and uh, that's the reason at some point we switched to a smaller template, not going beyond the femoral artery and not going caudal to the fossa ovalis. Uh, we could manage to do this template with a much smaller uh, incision and, uh, uh, you know, I haven't spoken in detail, but there was a clinically significant difference in the clavindendo complications between the MILD and the SILD template. MILD, the complications are much, much lesser actually. But all these is going to be uh, relevant only if we make sure that the oncological efficacy of MILD is, uh, you know, as good as that of SILD. And that is why we are looking back to this data. Uh, and I think that is the area which all centers which are not doing DSNB should be looking at 
and standardize you know the template so with that uh, we'll go to the next core mahindra yeah uh, thank you dr gagan for nice talk mahindra, on clinical ai zero are you there yeah so i would like to uh, invite uh, dr amitap say you can uh, invite the next speaker yeah yeah there has been a change uh, dr amitap singh is a consultant there has been a slight change uh, yeah. at uh, rajiv gandhi cancer institute uh, new delhi and he is going to uh, present a talk about on uh, robotic whale on whom and how dr amitap singh is up yeah, to you dr yeah good evening everyone so am i audible to everyone yes sir yes okay so yeah, yeah uh, go ahead Good. I was lucky enough to get this chance because there was some technical issues with uh, Dr. Sudhir Rawal sir, so he has asked me to present this talk. So I am supposed to present this robotic whale in whom and how. Indications of robotic whales are in node negative patient. It is being done as a diagnostic or a therapeutic procedure, whereas in node positive groins, it is being done as a therapeutic procedure with the following criteria if patient fulfills that. so these criteria are the lymph node should be less than 3 cm clinically palpable and there no there should not be any gross nodal fixation to the skin or underlying structures so these are the conventional port position for the robotic inguinal lymph node dissection although these robots are same for the laparoscopic inguinal lymph node dissection as well the difference is just only for the port size so here you can see this is inguinal ligament this is the medial boundary this is the lateral boundary medial boundary is lateral border of adductor longus and this lateral boundary is the medial border of sartorius we put camera port behind uh, like two finger break away from the apex of the femoral triangle we put two uh, robotic ports 8 mm both here in this diagram it has been seen 5 mm for the laparoscopic procedure we put a 12 mm assistant port between this uh, lateral port and the camera port for the technique we first create the space for the operating procedure with the blind dissection you can put the scope you can dissect the space as well with the use of scope you can use it as a balloon dissector also and after creating the space we dock the robot we put the instrument and we proceed with the surgical technique which i will describe later on so there are like two techniques which has been described for the whale either you can first develop this superficial space between the scarpa's fascia and fibro fatty tissue or you can develop this space between the fascia lata and the fibro fatty tissue although both technique has been described for the robotic whale and the outcomes are both same it all depends on the willingness of the surgeon and comfort comfortness of the surgeon whether he wants to go into the superficial space first or whether he wants to go to the deep space first this whole femoral triangle has been divided into the four parts and you have to cover the this whole fibro fatty tissue in this technique uh, two other techniques have been described for the port placement for the robotic whale one is this hypogastric whale technique which has been mainly being done by the chinese investigator for the vulval cancer and the penile cancer where they put three ports in the hypogastric region and they create the subcutaneous space and they do inguinal lymph node dissection on the both side another technique has been dis uh, described for the laparoscopic whale where they put the three port one is the camera port another is the 5 mm port another is the 10 mm port on the lateral border of the femoral triangle as seen in this uh, in this picture and this robotic whale has uh, proved its oncological safety and operative operative feasibility in various studies from the india as well as the other countries as well and although they didn't compare their outcome published our own experience where we compared our outcome with the open inguinal lymph node dissection where we included the patient of clinically n0 as well as clinical n1 also and i already mentioned the inclusion criteria for the node palpable groin the node should be size of the node should be less than 3 cm and there should not be obvious fixation of the node to the superficial skin and under uh, and the underlying structure it was a retrospective study and we included uh, 50 patient of the robotic inguinal lymph node dissection and 100 patient of the uh, 50 patient of robotic whale and 100 patient of the opening inguinal lymph node dissection 
and we included the patient from the 1st May 2012 to 31st May of 2016. Finally, we compare the demographic profile of the patient and they were all uh, matching in both arm of, uh, in both cohort of the robotic whale as well as open inguinal lymph node dissection. Uh, as far as concerned lymph node yield, uh, they were comparable in both group. There were like 13 lymph node yield in the robotic whale, whereas 12.5 in open inguinal lymph node dissection, and which were much better than, uh, than the Martins et al. series, where there was only nine lymph node uh, yield in the robotic whale. Coming to the uh, result of this study, we found there was intraoperative blood loss was comparable in the both studies, and the patient of robotic whale had a shorter hospital history, three versus four days, with significant uh, difference between the, these two. And we had a lesser days of in, uh, lymph node, uh, this uh, drain placement as well. And we had a significant lower incidence of age necrosis, flap necrosis and severe lymphedema in comparison to the open, open lymph, uh, inguinal lymph node dissection. So this is a surgical video, which we have already presented in European Urology Association. So this describes the technique of endoscopic inguinal lymph node dissection with the help of robo. In this video, we will present our surgical technique, feasibility and outcome of robotical lymph nodes. Patient had also poor positive for method creating a working space by blunt and sharp dissection. Below is carpus fascia through a 2 cm incision given 2 cm below apex of femoral triangle. Words are placed as given in diagram. First of all, Working space is increased by doing further dissection below the scarpa's fascia towards inguinal ligament and bilateral sides. During dissection, we try to dissect just below white glistening scarpa's fascia. After completing lateral dissection, lateral dissection is started with delineation of short suffness vein, which is usually found at center of thigh, just lateral to long suffness vein. find long surface vein at floor of working space. Medial boundary of dissection is medial border of adductor longus. After completing lateral and medial dissection, we start dissecting towards upper limit of dissection, that is external oblique aponeurosis. Careful dissection is required below scar pass fascia. Yes, Pita, can and you pause one required. minute remaining? Yes, sir. Sometimes okay. lymph node remain attached to scar pass section. We come across tributaries of great suffness pain. In non palpable node groin, we always try to preserve tributaries. But in palpable node groin, often it is not possible. So we clip and cut them to complete our dissection below Scarpa's fascia. And we saw main steps. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
talk i would like to thanks everyone for patience hearing okay uh, thank you dr abitab for a nice uh, uh, description of uh, a veil and the video sorry for the time constraint we are not able to enjoy it completely but the main step you have shown it's nice uh, so i'm not wasting uh, much time uh, i will uh, uh, just invite uh, our uh, new uh, next speaker uh, dr andrea nechi to deliver a talk on peri operative therapy for the groin dr andrea Please uh, take over. Thank you, Gagan, and the entire yeah. team for the invitation. And it's a real pleasure to be here with Philip and uh, and other esteemed colleagues to presenting you the data uh, and uh, and uh, and, the, and the landscape of the treatment of uh, perioperative therapy of uh, lymph node positive penile cancer. Uh, it's a certain an area of a medical need, uh, based on the fact mainly that we are dealing, as you already said, with uh, with the rare, rare tumors. So the evidence is is quite poor. Uh, these are my conflict of interest disclosure. So uh, penile cancer is indeed the, the disease where uh, the lymph node uh, phase. Uh, is critical in the entire course of, uh, of a patient's story. Uh, to me, as a medical oncologist, I would say that uh, the end stage is, uh, is the mainstay of the treatment of uh, penile cancer, is uh, the leading cause of death for, for these patients. And uh, in the start, it is actually the target of uh, systemic therapy in uh, most cases. Uh, but despite this, the role of surgery is still of paramount importance. And, uh, and you can see here on the right side of the slide, any additional therapy regarding uh, systemic therapy or radiotherapy uh, still, to, is, still has to demonstrate a substantial improvement in survival compared to surgery alone. Uh, these are the guidelines, currently EAU guidelines, suggesting a role for neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, with the platinum combination in uh, N3, clinical N3 patients, uh, and uh, for pathological N2 or N3 patients after, after surgical operation uh, in, the, in the adjuvant setting. Of course, uh, the recommendation may be regarded to as, uh, as strong or, or weaker, uh, but actually the, 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 the main message is still that we have to improve the outcomes. The story of systemic therapy in the penile cancer should be divided into periods. The first period is the pretaxane area, uh, when uh, we had the combination of uh, platinum with this in 5-FU or in Otacan or various regimens, and the more modern period uh, with the taxane and platinum combination, which uh, represent currently the standard of care uh, when, uh, when we have to use chemotherapy in, the, in these patients, uh, in particular, the TIP combination, paclitaxel, lifosamide, and cisplatin is, uh, the most, uh, uh, is the most frequently used uh, regimen in uh, penile cancer based on the data uh, generated by, by MD Anderson Cancer Center in uh, only 30 patients, of course, uh, showing that the, the, the response rate, the objective response rate approximated 50% and the pathologic response rate uh, 10%. Interestingly, uh, this data has uh, been uh, confirmed in the large meta-analysis, pulling together uh, data from retrospective, large retrospective series and, and a few prospective studies. And overall, 
we can say that with systemic therapy in the neoadjuvant setting, we can achieve a response, an objective response in about uh, 50% of the patients, a pathological response in almost 15, 16 patients, uh, uh, 15, 16 of the patients, and, uh, and the mortality and the long-term mortality in these patients is still uh, approximating 50%, meaning that we have to handle something that is uh, uh, moderately active at the short term, but we still have to improve substantially uh, when looking at the long-term outcomes of these patients. And uh, almost uh, one patient out of two on less than 1%, 1%, uh, 50%. Percent of the patients are still alive at long term at 10 years, five to 10 years. So we are still dealing with the deadly disease. Data from a retrospective studies like this one uh, suggested that, me, that uh, the situation may be more uh, fragmented in, uh, in different situations. And uh, for example, in uh, end clinical entry patients with pelvic lymph, 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 lymph node positivity, we may have. Uh, uh, an indication, a stronger indication for the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, respect to non-pelvic disease. Uh, for pelvic disease, we may have indications uh, for the use of for adjuvant chemotherapy, stronger indication for use of adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, for N3 patients with extranodal disease, we may have indication also to consider uh, radiotherapy added to chemotherapy in these patients. Uh, the, the, the real challenge in this patient is represented by patients with earlier disease, uh, clinical N0, N1, or N2 patients uh, for which there is no uh, indication or signal in the literature to use uh, perioperative chemotherapy, um, either in the, in the neoadjuvant or in adjuvant setting. Uh, the retrospective data that we have again suggests uh, that we may have a signal for, uh, uh, for improvement in survival with the use of uh, uh, chemotherapy in uh, the highest risk patients uh, like those with, uh, with the PN3 uh, stage. Uh, recent data uh, from, uh, again, from a retrospective, uh, from a multi-center retrospective studies from, uh, from many of the centers that which contributed to the global society or currently uh, provided tools for that may be useful for, for clinicians to identify the patients who, with a higher risk of developing disease occurrence following uh, lymphadenectomy. Uh, the, the, the website is uh, shown here. Every one of you could test uh, the risk of uh, 24 months occurrence in the patients, uh, in patients who undergo uh, inguinal lymph node dissection, plus or minus pelvic lymph node dissection, uh, and plus or minus perioperative chemotherapy. Uh, and this is essentially based on the number of involved lymph nodes, uh, the number of, me of metastatic lymph nodes, uh, the PN stage, and the surgical radicality of the, of the primary tumor, uh, of, the T, of the T tumor. Uh, and we may identify different uh, outcomes in different population and probably uh, the patients with the, with the higher risk uh, like those with um, uh, representing the, the, the yellow curve here uh, the, 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 uh, represent the most suitable patients for perioperative therapy. The dilemmas in adjuvant radiotherapy are still uh, still um, something that uh, affects everyday practice. Uh, we, we have a very, very limited data, in, uh, retrospective data, and also uh, in the reviews and systematic reviews and meta-analysis showing that the, the, the role of the adjuvant radiotherapy is still, uh, is still unknown, basically. Uh, in, as you have already represented, <laughs> In, uh, in, uh, in penile cancer may be a substantial target, but uh, according to the recent data generated by, by the multicenter group uh, and will be presented in, at large in a TESMO meeting, there may be a role for H in HPV positive patients uh, for adjuvant radiotherapy. Uh, HPV positive tumor may be more, more sensitive to radiotherapy compared to HPV negative patients. Uh, and this may be a, a way to targeted uh, uh, and to deliver more and more uh, uh, smart, in a smarter way uh, the use of radiotherapy in this uh, in this patient population uh, of course the impact study is, uh, is still ongoing uh, and uh, many of the questions related to the use of perioperative therapy perioperative chemo radiotherapy will be addressed 
by this uh, large uh, and potentially practice changing trial, which is uh, which is currently accruing, and uh, and of course I suggest you to put uh, to 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 spend all of your efforts to include patients in this uh, in this trial, and finally there are trials uh, as uh, Phil has already uh, mentioned. Uh, ongoing trials with immunotherapy or HPV targeted therapy in, uh, in advanced patients in the perioperative or first line metastatic setting using different uh, compounds added to immunotherapy. So the, the, the field is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is rapidly growing also in this, in this rare tumor. So everything basically, as you have already mentioned, uh, uh, should be the aim of, the, of the, our new society. Uh, which is gathering uh, collaborators from uh, from uh, all the countries uh, from worldwide and i think that also uh, looking at prospective studies we may provide a substantial improvement in the field uh, with uh, with next collaborations i would like to thank you everyone for your attention thank you dr nechi for a nice presentation and giving us insight on the role of perioperative therapy in hpv positive patients it also something new that we uh, learned today uh, so I would like to uh, invite the uh, uh, new speaker, uh, Dr. Balchandra Kashyapi. Also, he doesn't need an introduction uh, for us. So he's going to talk on uh, complication in dry or dissection. Have we, we been able to make a dent so far? Dr. Uh, Kashyapi, sir? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Please take over, sir. Yeah. yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. And let me, at the beginning, I would say thank the USI and the ISU, all the office bearers, and Dr. Gagan in particular, for asking me to speak on complications in groin node dissection. Have you been able to make a dent so far? Uh, it's very clear that the timely treatment of penile cancer nodal metastasis can be curative in a substantial number of patients. Still, there occur delays in instituting appropriate management. And why is it so? It's basically the morbidity of the groin node dissection versus the benefit. And that makes a lot of patients and sometimes even the treating doctors hesitant in offering timely treatment. When we discuss about the groin node dissection, we are basically discussing these standard zones of inguinal lymph node dissection and in addition, the pelvic lymph node dissection. Looking at the common complications of groin node dissection are, as we all know, is wound breakdowns, necrosis, infection, Persistent lymphoria, lymphocyte formation, lymphangitis, in the chronic stages, lymphedema of the lower extremity, penis and scrotum, and rare complications of surgery like femoral blowout and sometimes in neuropathy. These are the contemporary reports from post for post-operative morbidity after groin node dissection. And as you notice that they range in the range of about 50% for most of the things. Now, what can be the measures to reduce the GND complications? These can be divided into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. For preoperative measures, as has already been discussed by Gagan and by Abhishek about the prophylactic groin node dissection in high risk clinical N0 cases, that is, clinical N0 negative groins, downscaling of templates, modified and standard, shorter skin incision, saphenous vein sparing. DSNB and a laparoscopic or robotic valve, which I am not going to go into details on this. Based on the, and it's very well clearly seen uh, that the complications in N0 of lymph node dissection versus a radical lymph node dissection is a significant difference in both major complications as well as minor complications. So we should not hesitate to offer early groin node dissection in clinically high risk, clinically N0 groins. Before surgery, we should anticipate the skin loss and need for a rotational flap for a tension-free closure. Involve your plastic surgical colleague. Prophylactic antibiotics, preferably culture-specific. Start them preoperatively. Betadine scrubs for the groin and the genital area, starting at least 24 hours prior, maybe three or four times a day, to reduce the chances of infection. We need to realize that the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as Dr. Nietzsche just alluded to, I feel it's underutilized in general. If penile cancer is chemo responsive, uh, the TIP regimen based on experience from head and neck cancers is useful and we should consider in bulky nodes or skin involvement or deeper tissue fixity, considerable lymphedema or penile or limb at presentation. This was the landmark paper which Dr. Nietzsche alluded to from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Free drug regimen, paclitaxel, ifosfamide and cisplatinum given over three days. 
every three to four weeks, and it definitely showed the better survivals when there was absence of bilateral residual tumors or absence of external extension or absence of skin or subcutaneous involvement. More important, there was no significant increase in either early or delayed complications. So that hesitation of offering a chemo, it might increase the complications, should not also not be there. This was a 70-year-old male who had a partial pinectomy one and a half years ago, presented with left groin fungating mass of three months duration, delayed due to the corona COVID lockdown. This was the mass at presentation, and this was the CT scan, which showed a large nodal mass, almost involving the skin, partial doubtful fixity to deeper structures. This was the mass and the induration surrounding that. I thought it was worthwhile giving him a new adjuvant chemo. He received two cycles of TIP, and this is the picture just two days ago. There's a significant reduction in the mass. The skin involvement is not going to go up, it's going to be there. He will proceed to a remaining two cycles of chemo and followed by will come up for a surgery. This is another patient who has a significant penile edema and there's a nodal involvement of the nodal disease on the right groin. There's also a disease on the left groin. I think these patients may benefit with a neoadjuvant chemotherapy to reduce the morbidity and the complications. What intraoperative measures we can take? Avoid tumor spillage. If necessary, stitch a gauze piece on the fungating mass to prevent the tumor spillage. Plan adequate skin excision. Don't hesitate. You will always have your plastic surgical colleague to cover the defect well. You should also plan your skin incision well. Take help of the plastic colleague. Ask him what flap he's planning to cover it. So accordingly, you can tailor your incision. Important again is ligate or flip all lymphatic, not just cauterized, because as, as we all know, lymphatics don't get cauterized. Choice of incision is important. Various incisions have been described. Lazy yes, vertical, horizontal, uh, bilateral or parallel incisions. Important is avoid vertical incisions. My choice of incision generally, if I'm doing a pelvic lymph node as well as an inguinal lymph node dissection, is a single midline for a bilateral pelvic and two horizontals for the two groin inguinal incisions. Important to use the skin hooks so as to minimize the morbidity of the handling the flaps. This will and you can get the clear cut plane, which is below the superficial layer of the scapa When you raise the skin flap, the flap should not be too thin or there should be no button holding. The proper level of dissection is immediately beneath the superficial layer. And this is the line, the red line indicates this is the correct plane for developing the flap so that it doesn't become too thin. Generous use of clips and ligation is again recommended. There has been a study of using fibrin sealants. It has shown a decreased number of lymphatic drainage and lymphoria, but again, these are expensive and not commonly utilized. More important, perhaps, is ligating all the lymphatics rather than cauterizing them. Sartorius flap is important to cover the vessels when the vessels are exposed, when you have done a radical inguinal lymph node dissection to prevent the chances of any femoral infections or femoral blowout. Important to cover a sartorius flap. One should also anticipate the need for myocardial flap. This is possible in the preoperative setting only when you assess the patient for a surgery. Various flaps are possible, like anterolateral thigh flap or a tensor fascia lata flap, even a rectus abdominis flap. This picture shows on the left side is a groin node dissection with anterolateral thigh flap on both the sides, along with a total penectomy. When the right side picture shows a partial penectomy followed by bilateral groin node dissection with an anterolateral thigh flap. This is a tensor fascia lata myocardial flap. This is a flap which is raised on the right side, which will be tunneled under the, the skin panel to go to reach the right groin. While this is a similar flap which has gone under the front tunnel and has reached the left groin. The tensor fascia lata is also a robust flap. Currently, the, the preference of my plastic surgical colleagues is mainly for an anterolateral thigh flap. While closing the lymph node dissection, look for adequate hemostasis. There should be no frank lymphoria. Avoid dead spaces by good approximation of skin flaps to underlying structures. Suction drains, ensure the flap viability. You should ensure the skin flap viability. Pressure the edges, look for a dermal bleed. If available, you can use an indigo sign uh, for the ensuring the flap viability, flap viability, but that's not always required. Sir, eight minutes over, please. Yeah.
sir. Coming to the post-operative measures, maintain elastic rope bandages and compression stockings, DVT prophylaxis, early mobilization. Post-operative, more troublesome are the leg edema, which could be early, late, unilateral, bilateral, and penile and scrotal edema. Different stages of lymph edema. In some what is described by the physiotherapist, there are special lymphatic therapists, lymphedema specialists, complete degungestive therapy, compressive dressing, lymphalop press machines. We should be proactive in treating these lymphedema. Scrotal penile lymphedema, most of the time it's anterior scrotal skin which is involved. Surgical excision and primary closure may be required. Buried penis will also require a little bit straight thickness in grafting. Chance of returns do remain. This is a significant penile and the scrotal edema about four years after the kinectomy and bilateral groin dissection. This gentleman already has two episodes of life-threatening sepsis for, due to lymphangitis and lymphedema infection. Various established procedures are there for recalcitrant lymphedema, like liposuction, debulking, vascularized lymph node transfers, and microsurgical lymphatic anastomosis. You need to have a plastic surgical colleague for handling these issues. So summarizing, early prophylactic surgery with well-established surgical principles, consider new adjuvant chemo, improved intraoperative and postoperative techniques, be on the lookout for lymphedema and treat proactively. Definitely more collaborative studies needed to further decrease the morbidity. So the question is, was, have we been able to make a dent so far? Yes, the morbidity is decreased, but we still have room for improvement. The way ahead is the multidisciplinary collaborative efforts. And I would like to give my acknowledgments to Dr. Gaga and Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Tronga Professor and Kulkani sir and to Dr. Kaustu Prabhu my plastic surgical colleague. Thank you very much. Excellent, Dr. Dr. Kashyapi sir. Uh, exhaustive uh, presentation with uh, all the complications being uh, uh, explained in detail and how you manage each of these complications since you are vastly experienced in these surgeries, sir. Uh, uh, any questions from any of the uh, pa panel members or the uh, speakers? If there are no, we can go to the expert comments. So the, uh, I invite Dr. Uh, Tongaukar, uh, who is a, um, uh, a professor of uh, urontology, presently practicing at uh, uh, Hinduja Hospital, and Dr. Kim Amen and Dr. N. Raghun for the expert comments on this uh, session on penile cancer. Dr. Tongaukar, sir, you can take over, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. We can hear you. Yeah. Good evening. Um, thanks, uh, Gagan, for uh, asking me to be an expert and give my some comments uh, regarding all the presentations. Well, uh, as far as uh, penile cancer is concerned, there are many gray areas in the management, which in itself is a reflection of lack of good quality evidence in the form of RCTs, mainly because it's an uncommon cancer. Now, what the things that we need to improve the results is one is that there should be an improved risk stratification in N0 groin. As you said, invasive staging with either uh, modified lingual and lymph node dissection or DSMB is recommended in these N0 patients, especially high and intermediate risk patients. Now, this risk stratification is based mainly on histopathological factors like tumor grade or lymphovascular invasion. Now, although we do this risk stratification, we find that in patients, in these patients also, only 30 to 40 percent of them have positive lymph nodes. That means the vast majority of patients are still undergoing an unnecessary surgical procedure. May it be a lymphadenectomy or DSNB. So, can we somehow improve the risk stratification by incorporating maybe molecular and genetic markers and triage these patients so that we can define the highest risk group? and at the same time, reduce the number of procedures that need to be carried out with reduction of morbidity and uh, it will be more cost effective in our conditions. Secondly, in choosing between DSNB and MILD, I think the surgical option may be more universally suited to Indian conditions since it does not require any special infrastructure, can be carried out anywhere, has very low false negative rates, has low cost and with proper technique has very, very low morbidity. The second area of research, I think, is in the area of adjuvant therapy for node positive patients. There are no RCTs and there is only a level 2B recommendation for uh, adjuvant chemo and adjuvant chemo radiation. I think we should have some kind of uh, comparative uh, RCTs which compare these two approaches. And also, it will be useful to carry out uh, multi-center studies with, for targeted therapy 
because the, nearly 30% of patients of penile cancer have targetable gene alterations. So if we can uh, use these, especially uh, anti-EGFR um, uh, drugs or those who are PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, we can carry out this kind of studies as a collaboration and uh, maybe we can get better data. And lastly, I want to say something about um, the reduction of morbidity. Now, what we have found that over the years, the morbidity of open surgery has significantly reduced. And uh, today, if I do a lymph node dissection, there is maybe five less than 10% chance that the patient will have any kind of a skin uh, flap necrosis or edge necrosis. And that's been because of the proper technique. So I think it's just a technical issue. And that's why I really don't know what is the great need for a, something like a robotic way to be done. It is something which can be done only in specialized centers. It's very costly. But if you have done, uh, you know, if you look at the EAU guidelines 2019 and 2020, the complication rate of flap necrosis is less than 5%. And this is not one study, it's based on multiple studies. So I think the, we need to really do studies for robotic whale in N plus patients, not in N0. N0 is going to be the oncological equivalent. But in N1 patients, if we, have, we need to look at the oncological equivalence. Lastly, what I do in my practice is excise the part of the skin overlying the positive node electively, even if, if there is no lymph node, if there is no skin involvement, and put a flap. I think that will reduce the morbidity tremendously. Thank you. Dr. Raghun, uh, do you want to add anything on the robotic wheel part, what uh, Dr. Tungafer has uh, uh, mentioned? I think uh, we should take an opinion from uh, <clears throat> Professor uh, Kim Maven as well as before uh, I, I I talk anything. So we will request uh, Professor uh, uh, Kim sir to give his view on the matter as well before uh, we discuss uh, some of the aspects. Heyman sir has raised fantastic points, I mean amazing points. Uh, Gagan, there, there's one talk, one little five minute by Heyman, sir, would be enough for you to, you know, <laughs> set the scene for the last uh, session. So we'll request uh, Kim, sir, to uh, to share his views before we talk any further. Uh, thank you. I have only two or three comments to make. One is about the pathology, the AJCC eighth uh, edition and the seventh one. I think in the eighth one, urethra is a separate entity. But many a time when we do a partial amputation, we also get uh, the, the, the adjacent part of the urethra also involved. But I think it is a new eye-opening classification of AJCC 8th edition. Second is, um, as uh, Hemant uh, rightly uh, mentioned, the complications of open lymph node dissection has markedly come down. And uh, there has been recent data from the Lester group where they do both the uh, penile surgery and the groin dissection in a single stage. Earlier, they used to do in a stage procedure. I would like to get comments from the other panelists also in this regard. And third is, uh, I think, the increasing role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy for staged uh, disease. I think that these are the, uh, some of the uh, newer uh, results which has improved the uh, success and long-term survival of these patients and delayed recurrence. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Raghavan, your comments, please. Dr. Raghavan? Yes, sir. Thank yes. you so much, sir. Um, so, uh, already Heyman, sir, and uh, Kim, sir, has uh, set the scene. I think Sudhir, sir, has joined in as well. Sudhir, sir, hello. Good evening. So we'll definitely take his Hi. opinion on uh, robotic whale. So I have yeah, a few sure. points to make. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I, I really appreciate Santosh's uh, session on uh, AJCC classification. It's a huge change. It's a very welcome change as well because the involvement of uh, a corpora, uh, corpora, uh, corpora cavernosum does make a difference in the outcome of the patient and therefore it's a welcome change. But the urethra conundrum still continues. So something that uh, we can, we in India can do because of the volume of cases that we do, especially in Adayar and uh, Tata and, and in Rajiv Gandhi, that is an easily doable study on its own. HPV assessment in uh, India, for some reason, I'm not able to see much of work. Even I don't have the HPV staining in, in the Apollo hospitals here. But that's something which I sincerely believe that it is a huge value to make. 
um i thank uh, ragunath for making one thing very clear that fdg 18 pet is not useful in lymph nodes you go i mean in chennai gps prescribe fdg 18 pet if you have a sneezing episode you are given a fdg 18 pet so everything has an fdg 18 pet and the lymph nodes are also marked in that as active not active and so on and so forth it just confuses picture so much so thanks ragu for clearly making it very clear that fdg 18 pet is only for metastasis thank you so much for that um, i really appreciate uh, dr G- ganesh uh, presentation on penile preservation it's a extremely favorite topic that goes hand in hand uh, with uh, sanjay pandey's topic on uh, rehab because i am i came from a school of penile preservation uh, there are so many times i end up fighting with my medical oncology who wants a total penectomy when i just do a partial or a glenectomy because i i clearly tell them nodes are a different disease compared to the penis you don't need to you know mix both the guy needs to stand and pee and that is his you know for a man to stand and pee is something that he values and therefore we should give that opportunity for him so thanks ganesh for making that point i think uh, from this uh, i think m- most of the youngsters will take that opportunity to do it uh, pandey sir awesome talk and uh, gagan very very nice talk on n0 i mean the question that hemant sir really put the morbidity how to reduce the morbidity of n0 that's something we have been discussing for the last 20 plus years uh, and we still haven't made progress uh, some form of risk risk stratification using molecular studies we have to develop that who can develop other than you know india can develop because we have the highest number of patients uh, and therefore we should be able to develop this Uh, molecular markers for the n0 because that will make a huge difference whether to uh, observe the groin or to operate the groin a robotic wheel it's a very touch code topic uh, i am going to leave sudhir sir to talk about that but my if you take in a very prospective point of view i also completely concur with uh, hemant sir that uh, robot doesn't add to the value but it is definitely more cosmesis the flap necrosis if if we say in average and is about 7 to 10% let us say somebody who does only 3 4 cases a year a robot reduces the flap necrosis of significant point so that that significant change is the only thing otherwise um, i wouldn't say it is any different but your point about n1 groins whether robot is useful for n1 groins is that something to use only sudhir sir can answer that question i don't have that experience to tell that point Yeah. Um, thank you thank yeah. you rak uh, thank you so much and therefore i'm going to uh, just say that we have lot of research opportunities we should be able to take all that in because we have the collaborative capacity so there sir one or two points mm-hmm. before we close yeah yeah, yeah. doctor uh, so we invite you sir yes sir yeah. please uh, find yeah, thank you rakesh on, uh, wow. you yeah, i'm sorry my actually laptop uh, laptop got crashed and i no could issue, not sir. present this thing Uh, uh as far as n1 node is concerned you see the paper which amitabh has presented 50 uh, groin dissection by robot we have done more than that now and in that if you see the recurrence uh, there is no recurrence in the robotic arm and now that paper was in 2017 now it is 220 we have not seen any patient coming back to us and the that paper included n1 node you need not to have another you know evidence for that so a robot can be used in selective n1 node easily and uh, you can have better re- good results that's what i will say as far as uh, saying that the flap necrosis of open has come down you know how many years we have taken for flap necrosis to bring it down in open surgery uh, after maybe 3 4 years you will see there is something coming in the robot where you will be just doing icg or some other dye and removing only two three nodes and just that's it you are completing the surgery so things have to evolve you just cannot write off robotic surgery in any, any field today thank you thank you very much for for your expert comments and i thank all the speakers uh, who have uh, given their valuable uh, comments on the the topics and i hand it over back to gagan to go for the next session we are already late on the program so thank you very much everyone thank you yeah. thank yeah, you we will we'll, uh, just uh, invite the moderators for the next session dr uh, ravi and dr santosh faigankar you can take over from here please Dr. Ravi Hello am I audible now 
yes yes dr ravi go ahead yeah, thank you thank you vegan thank you usi and isu for this opportunity so i think after penile cancer without wasting much time let's move to testicular cancer again with the theme of this uh, program we would be discussing most of the controversial areas in testicular cancer management and we have an excellent speakers so dr sanjay edla dr vedang dr pramod krishnap and dr amit joshi and we have an international speaker sai mak danishman and this would be followed by expert comments by professor jn kulkarni dr arun chawla and dr tb uvraja so me along with dr santosh should be moderating the session i have this proud privilege of introducing my, our uh, international speaker dr uh, sai mak danishman uh he he is at usc he is a director of urology at uh, usc and he is director of clinical research and fellowship director at s of for seo he is the editor one of the members of editorial board of journal of urology uh, he was on the guideline panel of au seo for testicular cancer so none other than uh, dr saimik it would be very uh, enlightening to listen from <laughs> about uh, testicular cancer and his primary research highlights include the pathways to improve the perioperative outcomes for radical cystectomy post chemotherapy rpl nd dissection serum and molecular markers for diagnosis of testicular cancer and he was the principal investigator of uh, uh, extra uh, of the surgical management of uh, seminomas so uh, with that uh, i will invite dr santosh to introduce the first speaker thank you thank you dr ravi and uh, i reciprocate your thoughts and thank you for the organizers for the opportunity uh going ahead uh, scrotal violation can occur in many ways in testicular cancer and whether is it, it is, whether it is an indian problem or is it a problem at all i invite uh, our first speaker dr sanjay adla who is a consultant uro oncologist at apollo hospital hyderabad to deliberate on it over to you dr adla thank you very much gagan and usi for this opportunity i've got these two questions is it an indian problem or is it a problem at all and as we have had so many talks i thought i will start off with summary so the answer to that is it's a global as well as an indian problem and is it a problem at all definitely yes so you have got the summary of my talk i'll try to justify those two so to start off i thought <clears throat> i always ask my own questions in this so clinical scenario 30 year old with a palpable right hemiscrotal mass 2.2 cm discrete lump in the right testicle you would do the standard things in the form of tumor markers and then the sperm banking do we need to do an ultrasound scan of the testicle when you have got a palpable mass in the testicle do we need to do it and of course ct scan for the distant staging i wasn't very sure but when i looked up eau 2020 says it's a strong recommendation that you always do an ultrasound scan of the scrotum the reason for that is it will give you a confirmatory diagnosis as well as it will make a comment on the other testicle if there is a marked microcalcification or other lesions in the other testicle you will know you can deal with them when you are doing the when you are dealing with the orchidectomy on one side so ultrasound scan of the scrotum does need to be done before you do an orchidectomy further to make that point further this was a poster that was forwarded by gagan prakash so this is from uk uk the good thing about testicular cancer is it is absolutely regimented every patient will have the same investigation so they looked at 113 men who underwent radical orchidectomy because the clinical diagnosis was of testicular cancer over a five year period 113 patients who underwent the standard ultrasound scan clinical examination tumor markers and then they went and had an orchidectomy and for them in that series 23% of the men undergoing radical orchidectomy did not have a cancer do need to make a point that they included low grade ladic cell tumors as well as they considered them as benign so if you imagine if you do an orchidectomy on a clinically palpable lesion and it ends up being benign in india there is going to be much more litigia so that's the reason you do an or ultrasound scan to ensure that there is a lump and then go ahead and do an orchidectomy that wasn't the question that i was asked but i thought we'll start off in the investigational pathway so scrotal violation is a problem this is a study from tata memorial 17% of seminomatous germ cell tumors and 22% of non seminomatous germ cell tumors have got scrotal violation before they come to tata memorial you can say it is a biased study because only patients who need further because they had almost 
I think around 50 to 60% stage, more than stage two. So these were higher stage people. That's the reason there was a higher incidence of scrotal violation. What about the USA? 4.6% of the patients referred for RPLND were, have a, had a history of scrotal violation. And when you look at the worldwide, depending on which case series you look at, it seems to be four to 17% of worldwide orchidectomies tend to have a scrotal violation. So the first question is, is it a problem? Yes, it does seem to be a problem. And it isn't just because of the stage of the disease. When they looked at what stage of these patients are, three quarters of the patient have got stage one disease. So it is not, we are not talking about large bulky testicular masses wherein the operation was done through the scrotum. Is it of any importance? Yes, because almost all these patients need further adjuvant treatment. When you look at the seminoma, the commonest treatment that was delivered for this patient was radiotherapy and it included the ipsilateral groin and scrotum. I'm only going by what has been done. I'm not saying that this is what is the evidence-based one. Radiotherapy was offered as adjuvant treatment for all these which had scrotal violation. Whenever chemotherapy was done, they advised cord and scrotal margin excision. There is a one small study of 13 patients wherein they, when the cord was negative, they said that you can keep a surveillance on them, especially if they are seminoma. So seminoma, the commonest treatment, adjuvant treatment is radiotherapy. Chemotherapy can be considered. What happens with NSGCT? Adjuvant treatment, scrotal excision is almost a must. Majority, almost 70% of this patient had scrotal scar excision along with the card. And the primary treatment was based on the, whatever the primary stage of the disease was. And when they excise this, around 10% of the patient had viable tumor. That is the reason for almost always for the non-seminomatous going back to excise the scar is important. What does it mean for the patient? Alters the local lymphatic channel whenever there is one. We know that additional treatments and local chance of recurrence are much higher. This is in spite of the adjuvant treatment. So I'm not talking of without adjuvant treatment. In spite of adjuvant treatment, local chances of recurrence are higher in patients who have got scrotal violations compared to patients who did not have scrotal violation. And systemic metastasis, as well as cancer-specific mortality, there isn't any difference. So it seems to make a difference with respect to local control rather than systematic control. Scrotal violation, in summary, always do an ultrasound scan. As I have said, in an Indian population, it's yes, it is a problem, both Indian and global. And is it a problem at all? Definitely yes, because all the patients need adjuvant treatment and some need additional treatments as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kedla, for the wonderful uh, talk. I hand over to Dr. Ravi. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for that insightful talk. There's one question in the chat box. How does microcalcification in contralateral testes change the actual management? Yes. So whether whether we consider microcalcification as a part of as a precancerous one. So there is one study wherein when they said there were more than five microcalcification, then they need to be under much more intensive follow-up. So let's say that you have got microcalcification more than five focuses and you're doing an architectomy on one side for testicular cancer, that would increase the chance of you needing to do a biopsy on the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Yeah. So the, let's go on to the next talk. It is by Professor Vedang Murthy. He is a well-known figure uh, to all the oncologists. The talk is on prediction of post-chemotherapy viable disease, emerging and exploratory tools. Over to Dr. Vedang. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi. Thank you, Gagan and USI, uh, for this uh, excellent opportunity. I uh, hope my slides are visible and I'm audible. Yes, yes. Uh, and Gagan, uh, particularly thanks to you for giving me this uh, uh, complex sounding uh, title. And I'll do try to do full justice to it by not only talking about one emerging modality and one exploratory tool, but also one established tool that has probably... Uh, some questions are being raised about it. So to get everybody on board on the same page, post chemotherapy, about 60 to 80 percent patients will have some kind of a residual mass. In NSGCTs, uh, about half of them have necrosis or fibrosis, and it is important to differentiate this from teratomas or viable GCTs. That's the basics. Uh, in seminomas, again, the desmoplastic and fibrotic reactions make the residual mass difficult to operate um, with significant morbidity and also 
uh, it is difficult to differentiate this from the viable uh, cancer. So how do we identify this viable disease? Uh, the biopsy can be done, obviously, but uh, it's easy to miss the target. <clears throat> A surgery uh, uh, sh should be done, especially in NSGCT, uh, but the idea is to avoid the morbidity and seminoma, it's difficult. Uh, CT scan can clearly be done, but it is uh, lacks sensitivity and positive predictive value, so we need something else. Uh, I'll be talking about these things. Uh, as I said, one is an established tool, but there are some recent doubts in the, in the recent times, PET-CT. I'll be talking of a biomarker called MIR-371 and uh, a tool called radiomics. Uh, most of you are well aware of the role of PET CT in this uh, in this situation. Uh, it has no role in uh, NSG CT, but in seminomas, what we know from large surgical series are that after chemotherapy, if a residual mass is more than three centimeters on CT, there's about a 20 to 30 percent chance that there is active seminoma in that. How do we pick that up? Uh, the classic uh, paper uh, uh, in 2004 called the SEMPET trial. It was a multicentric trial that really established the role of uh, 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 PET CT in this setting. A small trial of 51 patients, and they they compared the results of the PET CT with histology or clinical radiological course, and and remarkably said that the positive predictive value is 100% for uh, uh, PET as compared to what 37% for CT. So this was quite a remarkable result. And just to remind you of these uh, complicated definitions. PPV is the proportion of people with a positive test result who actually have the disease. So if the uh, PET says it is positive, then there is disease. And 100% is quite remarkable. But over the last two decades, um, several people have raised questions about the accuracy and PPV of PET. And the most recently in this uh, large uh, multicentric retrospective study, but, uh, uh, but quite, a, uh, quite a good study, very similar to PET, uh, SEMPET, but retrospective in nature. When they looked at uh, SUV cutoff of four, the positive predictive value was just hovering between 20 to 30%. It was not great. And uh, these people and others, including ourselves, we have also looked at our data, have cautioned against the clinical de decisions based solely on PET. So uh, our own experience of 73 uh, patients, this is being considered for publication. Uh, we have compared PET with uh, clinical imaging and follow-up, and we not only included uh, SUV, but also included the size, uh, uh, more than three centimeters, and found the PPV to be around 30%. So you can see the difference. This is DeSantis, is the SEMPET study. The PPV seems to be lower than, uh, it's around 30 to 40% at most. So to summarize the PET issue here, it has a very high negative predictive value for these masses, and it's reassuring if the PET is negative that there is no seminoma in that mass. But if the PET is positive, there's on, uh, the, because of its low PPV, there's only a 30% chance that it is disease and it will relapse. So moving on to the, uh, the emerging tool that now is, this is a biomarker called miRNA. MicroRNAs represent small non-coding RNAs that are involved in the epigenetic regulation of gene expression. I'm uh, clearly not an expert um, uh, on the mechanisms to elucidate how it works, but these are secreted in the uh, extracellular fluids and the plasma or serum uh, levels can be used as a biomarker. Uh, the first big paper uh, came in uh, about uh, five years back when uh, they looked at a number of uh, potential miRNAs for testicular cancer and found that among all the candidates, this particular, particular one called MIR371A-3P, or it's called the M, um, RNA test for testicular cancers, showed the most potential. And uh, a remarkable study came uh, just uh, last year, a couple of years back, which looked at this, uh, it, and I think this will probably change the way we, uh, we practice uh, uh, management of these masses. Large number of patients, including seminomas, NSGCTs, and controls were studied. Uh, RT-PCR was done. We've been hearing about this uh, test very uh, frequently in the recent times. Uh, they also compared uh, MIR with standard markers, and they addressed a number of issues. How the expression of these markers 
reduces with each cycle of chemotherapy, is predictive and prognostic. Uh, they, in fact, also very interestingly showed that if the expression doesn't come down, the patient does poorly. They, they, come, they looked at the expression uh, and compared it with stage. Higher the stage, more the expression, which is also uh, very nicely shown in this positive correlation. Uh, beautifully seen, larger the mass, larger the diameter, higher the expression. They compared it with classical GCT markers and the sensitivity of miRNA-371A was nearly 90% as compared to combined effort of all these three, which was reaching about 60%. Very interestingly, recurrent GCT could be identified from controls. But our question is different. Does it help to, so, and I must say, those who are interested should look that paper up. It's really detailed and very nice, but it doesn't answer the question that we're trying to ask today. What about a residual mass? So the Canadians published this a couple of years ago. Uh, mRNA, the same, same RNA uh, for uh, the residual mass, and they showed that it can differentiate. The expression in viable GCT is higher than in either teratoma or fibrosis. So this gives some food for thought that this uh, viable GCTs can be uh, picked up. Now, the next approach, this is the completely exploratory, is a radiomics approach. Radiomics basically is a quantitative analysis of medical images. And uh, uh, images are just not pictures. They are considered to be data nowadays. So uh, uh, the data is extracted by specialized software. There are several available, some proprietary, some online. And these are extracted either as first order or second order features. I'm not going to go to the details of this. But uh, the first order features uh, talk about or denote the magnitude of, uh, of the image density and the second order is about heterogeneity. So this study actually is the only one that has uh, explored this. Uh, we are also planning something on these lines uh, shortly. Uh, can radiomics help to predict the pathology of this post chemotherapy masses? And they, they studied the post chemotherapy, but pre RPLND contrast enhanced CCT in 35 teratomas, 28 fibrosis, and 14 the viable GCTs. Dr. Vedan, wind up this. You, you can see the rock curves. Uh, the blue and the yellow ones did very well. So, differentiating teratoma versus GCT fibrosis um, had an accuracy of 76%. But the most important clinically relevant question was differentiating fibrosis from GCT or teratoma that can avoid a surgery um, if required. So that was about 72%. And when this was combined with the clinical predictors like size and markers, that improved to 88%. So this is, the, this is really exciting and probably presents an opportunity to uh, avoid RPLNDs. To summarize, a PET has a high negative predictive value, so it's reassuring, but a low positive predictive value, so use it carefully when it is positive. MIRNA, as I said, will probably change the way we manage GCTs, and this particular candidate 371A, 3P, seems to be the best one. It can differentiate GCT from teratoma fibrosis, whereas radiomics is a new field, and it appears that it can differentiate fibrosis from GCT teratoma. So probably a combination of these things will be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vedan, for an excellent talk. So over to you, Dr. Santosh, for the questions on the chat box. Um, Dr. Vedan, thank you so much for the talk. It was really insightful and could learn a lot. Uh, there were a couple of questions, but they have already been answered. Uh, but I'd like to ask one question, probably one related that does the presence of extra retroperitoneal residual mass indicate poor prognosis with normalized tumor marker? That's one question I'll put across to you. Um, Should I repeat the question? No, no, I can see it here. So does yeah. it mean a mediastinal uh, mass? And are we talking of a seminoma or NSGCT? So generally, uh, uh, if you're talking of a mediastinal mass... Uh, retroperitoneal, abdominal, and NSGCT. NSGCT. Extra retroperitoneal. Yes. Yeah. So if we uh, so uh, on its own, it, it does not indicate a poor prognosis as far as I I know. Uh, but if it cannot be operated, which is often the case in mediastinal masses, then uh, things can get uh, uh, things can get a uh, uh, little difficult. 
maybe uh, some one of the urologists one of you can uh, answer this if if that is not enough okay uh if there are no more questions i would move on to the next talk uh, as has been mentioned earlier that uh, rpl end is a very complicated procedure with its own share of surgical complications uh, so i i invite our international faculty dr danishman who would enlighten us on the surgical considerations to decrease the complications of rpl end over to you dr danishman thank you uh, hopefully you can all hear me well so yeah. um I've been asked to talk about surgical considerations um, for reducing complications of uh, RPLND. Uh, just a little bit of history. RPLNDs were first done in the early 1900s. This is what the incision looked like. Uh, we've come a long way uh, from this. A uh, few words about minimal invasive post chemo RPLNDs, uh, technically quite demanding, very few reports in the literature. Rasweiler was one of the first to report it uh, with seven of nine conversions. These were stage two patients. They, these were laparoscopic. And Polisi reported two of seven at Johns Hopkins, again, requiring open conversions. Um, and uh, Kalistropat would reported uh, three of 26 who were converted. So these were early uh, reports. And of course, uh, we've come a long way from that. Uh, uh, I wrote an editorial with uh, Dr. Gill on a, another lap series and 100 patients with long-term follow-up. Uh, complications of open conversions were, were low with excellent ejaculatory function uh, results. However, uh, most of the patients had residual masses less than one centimeter for whom we would not even have done the operation. We would have observed, uh, observed these patients. So what are the advantages of an invasive, uh, less blood loss, less hospital stay, uh, less pain management, uh, and perhaps faster recovery? Uh, but disadvantages are longer operative times, lower um, lymph node yields, uh, oftentimes lack of dissection behind the great vessels, and higher rate of adjuvant chemotherapy use. The whole point of surgery really is to avoid the addition of chemotherapy for cure. And there is some concern still about potential tumor dissemination with pneumoretroperitoneum. So um, we move on to uh, robotic-assisted uh, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. <clears throat> there have been a number of series, again, quite limited with, uh, you can see on one of them here, 12 post-chemo RPLNDs, one converted to open, eight with anti-grade ejaculation. We don't consider that a good good uh, result here. OR times are long. Uh, EBL is low and length of stay is about three days. So in most of the reports, you'll see technically feasible, acceptable morbidity and mortality. Here's another series. Uh, from India, 13 patients, median hospital stay four days, good lymph node counts. Uh, 10 of 13 had necrosis only, so obviously a selected series here, but four with Kyla societies out of 13 patients, which is concerning because this should not be a common occurrence. So um, here's a, a series from the US with Jim Porter reporting on, on 20 different cases. Most of them you see are stage one and early uh, stage two disease. Um, uh, many of them have not had prior chemotherapy, um, and uh, many of them end up getting adjuvant chemotherapy. So again, even after two decades, the, the, the uh, uh, experience is quite limited. So what about the rest of the world? Many of the places around the world don't have uh, uh, the use of robotic uh, te technologies. Uh, a number of years ago, I uh, sort of uh, came up with uh, this technique of midline extraperitoneal technique, which is really just an extension of uh, various other uh, extraperitoneal techniques that have been described in the, in, the, in the past. But you can see you can get excellent exposure. This is identical to any kind of intraperitoneal exposure. Our initial hospital stay was three days. Um, most of these were post-chemotherapy RPLNDs as we don't advocate uh, doing stage one RPLNDs, uh, we advocate um, uh, surveillance. This is a video, I'm not gonna play uh, much of it if it plays at all. Uh, so looks like I can't really forward it. So what I'll do is um, I'll, for the sake of um, time, just show this, uh, but, but that's available at European Urology. But uh, here, hopefully you can see uh, that this is an extra peritoneal technique. The peritoneum has been pulled over. Uh, the plane between the gerotus fascia and the peritoneum has been developed, and you can get excellent exposure on both sides. Now, you can see this is a right-sided um, extended template. This is actually a full bilateral template, uh, and the peritoneum has been pulled all the way over to the, to the right side. 
the bowels are kept inside, they're kept warm, and uh, there's significant uh, uh, um, uh, uh, advantages for recovery. So this is uh, our updated series. Um, uh, almost all patients now at USC undergo in post chemotherapy RPLND undergo this midline extraperitoneal technique, except for the very, very large masses. You can see the complication rates are actually very, very low. Most of them clavian grade one. Uh, there was one grade three B uh, requiring a percutaneous uh, tube for uh, uh, fluid collection. And you can see as our experience expanded, uh, so did our size of the mass. So now uh, we were, uh, many of these, 19 of these uh, were done for large size masses. Um, uh, and you can see the ejaculatory function rate on the bottom uh, left here, the anti-grade ejaculation for primary RPLND was 92% and in post-chemo RPLND, 96.8%. Uh, so we're doing uh, definitely the larger masses, uh, trying to um, uh, preserve ejaculation as much as possible in uh, as many patients as possible. So you can, you can see, and most important, the length of stay, um, sorry, just go to go back, length of stay about three days in this series, but more, more recently, our median hospital stay has come down to two days and with many patients actually going home the next day. We're working on a series right now uh, of, of the selected patients who've gone home uh, after post chemo RPLND the very next day. Uh, so here's a, a left-sided, again, um, exposure. I showed you the right side. Now we only gain exposure on one side. So this is, you can see, you can get all, all over to the, uh, the uh, paracable uh, area. Uh, here's a, a larger size mass, a 12 centimeter mass. Once you get your exposure, you can actually have uh, excellent, uh, again, uh, exposure with preservation of the uh, uh, nerve there. There's the mass. Um, here's another, uh, the incisions have become smaller and smaller. You can see the peritoneal envelope being pulled over uh, this larger mass, and that's the kind of exposure you get on the right side. Um, and this path uh, showed 18 centimeter teratoma. The length of stay for this patient was two days. Um, here's another one, a growing teratoma syndrome, uh, quite large mass, and you can again get uh, quite a good exposure uh, with preser preservation of the nerve. This is what the uh, incision looks like so about six weeks later, a 15 centimeter teratoma, length of stay was one day. Uh, in this patient recovering quite well. Uh, uh, this is six months out from uh, surgery on the right side. You can see that uh, incisions are uh, quite small and really compete with uh, the uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery. Now we can get quite high as well, uh, getting up to the retrocrural area. Um, you can see on the right side, uh, if the video is playing, um, again, good exposure in the inter aortic cable area with preservation of the L3, L4, postganglionic sympathetic nerve, uh, super hyalur um, uh, exposure there. And there's the cruise of the diaphragm. And uh, really, you can get into the retrocrural area uh, up there entirely extra peritoneal. There's the cruise again. And if you pull that medially, you'll get to the retrocrural area uh, to, to dissect in that area as well. So, um, you know, to summarize, midline extraperitoneal RPLND reduces the surgical morbidity, it accelerates bowel function, and essentially has completely eliminated the risk of SBO, small bowel obstruction, without compromising the complete template resection. There are obviously some nuances to the technique. It does take some experience, uh, but for those who are experienced with uh, any kind of extraperitoneal approach, uh, this, I think, offers a, a great advantage uh, um, to reduce the morbidity of the procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganeshman, for touching on this very important aspect of a very complicated surgery and look, making it look so simple. I hand over to Dr. Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganeshman. It was a fantastic uh, talk. So I don't see any questions on the chat box, but I have a question. So have you really compared your uh, midline extrapital approach to the robotic approach, uh, which is being practiced by others in your center? And is there a difference between the RPLND which you do for a seminoma versus a non seminomatous germ cell tumor? Yes, good question. So um, we essentially um, uh, approach all of these uh, with this midline extraperitoneal approach. There are really only a handful of um, robotic surgeries done at our center for, for testicular cancer. So we have not done a, a comparison 
uh, at all. Uh, there are very, very few robotic cases actually for, for post-scheme marfilling because we have extensive robotic experience for everything else. Um, as far as seminoma or non-seminoma, no, there's no difference. We approach both of them the same way. Um, it really doesn't matter what we have in the retroperitoneum. You, you can see you get, you get the same exposure. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we move on to the next talk, which is by Dr. Pramod Krishnapa. He is the head andrology division department of virology at NU hospitals. And he would be touching up an important topic, fertility preservation, maximizing the efforts at every step. Thank you. Over to Dr. Pramod. Thanks, Dr. Ravi Mohan. Now, I'll be covering the fertility aspects in testicular cancer. We all know the uh, very high survival rates in the testicular cancer. The most important aspect is that it affects the uh, age group, which has the maximum uh, fertility potential, that is between two, 20 to 40 years of age. And the testicular dysgenesis syndrome, which was first proposed in 2001, uh, which said that the reduced semen quality, testicular cancer, hypospadias, and undescended testis, they're all interlinked and they all, all uh, belong to the clinical manifestations of the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. And different mechanisms have been proposed how a testicular cancer can affect the fertility. Uh, number one, increased beta HCG values uh, can alter the hyp pituitary hypo hypothalamo pituitary axis. And it can also increase the uh, estradiol levels, which in, can, which in turn inhibits the spermatogenesis. The testicular tumor as such can affect the blood testis barrier, which leads to production of the uh, anti-sperm antibodies, again, which has an inhibitory effect on the spermatogenesis. And we also have seen that the word cancer itself can uh, make around 43% of the couples to have a reduced sexual activity, which directly, of course, affects the fertility. And EAU guidelines has uh, a strong recommendation for the sperm banking. And uh, these are the fertility tests which are advised, total testosterone, LH, FSH, and the semen analysis. ASCO also recommends uh, sperm cryopreservation, and it says it should be discussed in all patients uh, in post-pubertal males. When it comes to pre-pubertal children, uh, testicular tissue cryopreservation is still investigational. Coming to the sperm cryopreservation as such, of course, it's ideal if it is done before the orchidectomy. The reason is if the semen analysis shows azospermia, then you can use that orchidectomy specimen to extract the sperms. Uh, that means you can do an oncotise. Additional vials needs, needs to be uh, 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 cry cryopreserved in case of a seminoma and uh, high, very high AFP levels or when the total motile counts are very low. And of those who attempt assisted conception using this cryopreserved sperm, almost 55% achieve paternity. So in spite of this, why are we not doing uh, such a discussing of uh, cryopreservation is that uh, the discussion is not happening uh, during the uh, oncology consultations. And even if this is advised to the patients, only 30% of them uh, do the uh, bank their sperms. And of which the most important is that uh, uh, the coordination among different specialities is difficult. Uh, again, the, the, one of the most important aspects is where to refer. In an advanced country like US, 63% uh, of the uh, institution in the US have no dedicated male infertility care. And all my experience in male infertility has been uh, when I was a fellow under Professor Neideberger. Any patient walking into the male infertility cl clinic who has a very variable uh, sperm counts would be advised to cryopreservation, whether it's a benign or for a malignant cause. So that's how common cryo sperm cryopreservation is advised in the United States. And what, how we do the cryopreservation at our center is, uh, first we, sa we sample, we uh, process the semen sample using a density gradient using the 40% and the 80% uh, gradients. And then we use the sperm wash and then uh, use the sperm freeze, that is the basically the uh, cryoprotectant, cryopreservant. And then and these are, the sperms are stored in these vials and then they're transferred to these cryo tanks. And we should all know that the post thaw sperm loss is around 30%. So that's the reason why we need to uh, store additional vials in, in some of the conditions. And the, again, the cost is a significant factor because the patient is already paying for his cancer treatment. The fertility uh, treatment, again, will be an additional cost. So 
Uh, again, cost is an important factor. We charge uh, at our center. We charge five thousand for the six month for six months, and 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 it's a six monthly renewal fee. And on cotisa, like I said, is basically extracting sperms from the orchidectomy specimen. Um, use use of a surgical microscope has a lot of uh, uh, advantages, and uh, we usually pick up the dilated looking tubules. And if if the tubules are picked up far away from the tumor, usually it's high chances of finding a good uh, mature sperms. And this uh, paper just presented last month in the uh, virtual EAU Congress. This basically said that uh, surgical sperm ret retrieval rates are same even uh, in, uh, uh, in in testicular cancer and also in the benign groups. So how does the uh, in, uh, testicular cancer treatment as such affects the fertility? Uh, orchidectomy, it causes around 40% uh, chances that a patient may become oligo or isospermic uh, up to three weeks post-operatively. The recovery is dependent on the baseline FSH level. Post-chemo, um, uh, it needs 12 months to recover the sperm counts if he if 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 has been given uh, less than two cycles of BEP. And if more than five cycles are given, he may need more than two years. And he's usually advised uh, 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 not to have conception uh, for six months post-treatment. And if there's no recovery, even after two years, uh, micro is, uh, is suggested. Post-radiotherapy, 24% become uh, azospermic after six months. And the recovery is usually after two years. If there is no recovery, even after two years, again, the micro is done. Post RPLND, again in RPLND, Dr. Uh, Dhaneshman uh, spoke of the surgical techniques. Uh, this planting nerves and the hypogastric plexus have to be preserved. That is a nerve sparing RPLND. Even if this nerve spa sparing RPLND is done, there is still a 15% chances that uh, a patient can have ejaculatory issues. I'm not an expert to give tips on the surge on the now sparing RPLND. Basically, we need to preserve uh, this uh, lumbar sympathetic uh, lumbar nerves and the hypogastric plexus. And post chemo RPLND, of course, the standard is to do a full bilateral infrahilar template dissection. But if there is a fertility uh, concern, then a modified template can be done. How to assess the ejaculation post RPLND? Uh, most of the patients will have uh, uh, ejaculatory issues in the immediate post-operative period. So it's best assessed usually three to four months after the RPLND. And how do we treat these ejaculatory issues? To be frank, most of the ejaculatory dysfunctions are difficult to treat, whether it's cancer or a benign uh, cause. Uh, usually you can try with imipramine and, uh, and, and try semen analysis after a month. If it's not helping, then uh, if it's a retrograde ejaculation, you have a strong suspicion, then you can alkalinize the urine by giving a sodium bicarbonate for three, four days and then catheterize and see if you can retrieve sperms from the bladder. And most of these patients end up with a surgical sperm retrieval. And post-orgasmic urine analysis can be used uh, uh, to uh, diagnose retrograde ejaculation. And of course, this test becomes valid only when uh, the initial semen sample uh, is azospermia. This is one of the landmark paper quoted in most of the review articles, paper from Norway, where they uh, noted that the paternity rate is around 71%, even without the use of the cryopreserved sperm. sperm. And if you see the subsection analysis in the same paper, if you see the last line here, success at post-treatment conception, if you see the different groups, uh, only in the group which had which had received a high dose uh, cisplatin had uh, uh, had a lower uh, conception rates. Others, you can see here, it's ranging between 60 to 80. This is one of the papers which is commonly used to argue, saying that anyway the patient is uh, going to be fertile after two to three years, 70% uh, of them are going to be fertile after two to three years. Then why are we going to do all this circus uh, assessing his fertility? What I would like to argue is that in metastatic prostate cancer studies, we see two, three, four months as a significant survival. Then why don't we take uh, consider the two years as a significant uh, in a testicular cancer patients? Sir, uh, that you need to wind up, sir. Yeah, yeah. So when it's a kidney tumor, we assess its function. Uh, but when it, when it comes to testicular cancer, most of us do not assess the reproductive potential. 
And as such, there are so many issues uh, in many of the couples these days. And the female age is also very important. If you see uh, at, at, at around when she's on 38 to 40 years, her reproductive potential reduces to as low as 5%. And, and also there's significant decline in the sperm counts all over the world. It's declining around 50 to 60%. So it's time the oncofertility collaboration uh, uh, should be done. Uh, and there are uh, some resources where uh, there are online uh, consortium resources. And to summarize, yes, this is the, my summary slide. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pramod, for that uh, wonderful uh, talk on, on an aspect which, which is generally ignored. So over to Dr. Santosh for any questions on the chat box. Yeah, Dr. Pramod, thank you so much. I have a couple of questions. One is, what is your experience with the respect to a, a compliance or acceptability of various fertility management uh, protocols that you just mentioned in our set of populations? That's the first question to you. Yeah, so uh, the, basically we hardly get any referrals. To be frank, I just came back from my fellowship last year. So I'm yet to receive a single uh, referral from an oncologist for uh, cryopreservation for the oncology purpose. Okay, the second question is, uh, are, uh, are these babies who are born after this uh, techniques or management uh, protocols like cryo, do they have any problems? Do you have any uh, data no. on that? I had a slide actually, I skipped it. Uh, it. Studies have shown that there are no any additional uh, risk involved with the uh, assisted reproductive techniques. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. If, if there thank are no many, uh, not any questions, I can move on to the next uh, talk. Uh, we all know that first line uh, cisplatin based com combination therapy uh, works wonders in GCT, and most of some of these patients do recur in a disseminated way, necessitating the need of a salvage chemotherapy. So I invite uh, Dr. Amit Joshi, who is the uh, professor of medical oncology, especially uro-oncology from Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai, to uh, share his view on this. I hand over to Dr. Joshi. Dr. Joshi? Hello? You need to unmute. Dr. Amit Joshi? Yeah. Okay. Am yeah. I able to? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Please go ahead. Please go ahead, Dr. Yeah. Joshi. So today's my topic is option of service chemotherapy, ground reality. So in the current management, where, where we know that with the effective use of cisplatin based chemotherapy, majority of the patients are cured, but around on an average, 30% are patients are still fail to achieve the uh, uh, remission. So the treatment option are the standard salvage uh, chemotherapies and the second most common option which is used is the high dose chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant. So coming to the uh, various salvage chemotherapy which are used in these options are the tip based regime which is paclitaxel, ifosfamide and cisplatin, the winblastin, ifosfamide and cisplatin and the second regime is the cisplatin, ifosfamide and etoposide. Coming to the results of these studies, the tip has a better result with a complete response rate in the in the, uh, um, the around 70%, whereas in the VIP and the uh, VVIP has a control rate of around 25-30%. I will discuss with uh, later regarding the why this tip has a better uh, control rate compared to the other two, two regime. So these are the three standard treatment options for solving the tip, winblastin based chemotherapy and cisplatin and the uh, ifosfamide based uh, chemotherapy. Coming to the second option, uh, this graph showing the two options for the treatment. The upper one, uh, 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 that is the yellow line is the high dose chemotherapy and the yellow uh, blue line is the conventional chemotherapy. So the, uh, these are the indirect comparison of high dose chemotherapy versus the conventional dose chemotherapy and the indirect comparison clearly shows that the high dose chemotherapy may have an edge over the conventional chemotherapy in relief setting. But, uh, 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 Please note that these are the indirect data and the direct comparison is on, ongoing. So the in, indirect comparison, the high dose chemotherapy have has a edge over the conventional dose chemotherapy. Coming to the various chemotherapies, the most commonly salvage chemotherapy which is used in the current practice is the tip-based chemotherapy. That is paclitaxel, ifosfamide, and, uh, and cisplatin. But coming to the patients and method, the important point note in this study that the patient which are included in this study were having a testicular primary and had a prior complete response to the first line chemotherapy regime which had been identified previously as a favorable prognostic factor that means 
in the in this uh, uh, re regime or in, in uh, for this patient uh, chemotherapy regime the patients are selected which are having a good biology so that the patient who achieved a complete response of uh, with the previous cisplatin chemotherapy and now they have relapsed so they have not taken the relapsed refractory and mediastinal tumor so that is the region this patient population has a better control rate which is ranging in the 60 70% compared to the other uh, chemotherapy regime and the important aspect of this is also that this chemotherapy regime which has been used commonly in this scenario is a 250 mg per meter square 24 hour infusion which is a, a difficult in day to day se setting so uh, most of the time in day to day practice instead of the uh, 250 mg per meter square 24 hour infusion most center uses 175 mg per meter square for 3 hours so that is not the optimum regime that is being used in this study population coming to the result of this study this hence in this study population where they have taken a favorable patients the result was uh, quite remarkable with around 65% durable cr rate at at 2 year so with the result of this uh, data the tip becomes standard therapy for salvage in first line setting in patients who have at least a, a good a favorable prognostic factor coming to the uh, result of high dose chemotherapy uh, so this uh, 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 paper was presented in 2005 in this study the that is known as it94 uh, uh, trial the patients of a relapsed uh, uh, testicular tumor were divided into two group one group received the conventional uh, uh, high dose chemotherapy and one group received the standard salvage chemo chemotherapy of vip and other group received three cycle of chemotherapy followed by one cycle of transplant so the, the most important point note, noted in this uh, uh, trial is that the patient uh, achieved I have undergone only one cycle of transplant after first day. and this uh, trial unfortunately showed that the single agent single cycle of high dose uh, transplant was as good as the conventional salvage chemotherapy so with this result the uh, role of transplant is still remained uh, uh, doubtful then came uh, the uh, famous uh, einhorn paper from indianapolis in this group they uh, what they did they uh, uh, do, uh, they done the two tandem transplant that is one autologous transplant followed by second autologous tra tra transplant and that is the region they uh, their group achieved a very good control rate which was ranging from ar around 94 percent patient achieved disease free out of 135 group so i think uh, the most important uh, thing which has changed from the previous it94 for the second uh, tra transplant whereas in the previous studies only one transplant but so uh, by this time the high, uh, high dose chemotherapy has also become one of the one of the standard treatment for transplant but the question remains same whether in a patient of salvage uh, 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 who are relapsed after first line of chemotherapy whether auto bmt with tandem transplant is the standard of care or tip of four cycle is the standard of care so still the, the answer is the tiger trial this is a, an ongoing trial where the uh, 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 patients in this uh, study the, this is a two arm study one arm is receiving the standard uh, 250 mg per meter squared uh, chemotherapy regime paclitaxel for 24 hour for four cycle follow and the second arm mind the second arm second arm is a more intensive where the cycle and cycle 1 and 2 will receive paclitaxel plus ifosfamide and in cycle 3 to 5 the patient will undergo high dose chemotherapy followed by trans, uh, uh, followed by stem cell res rescue so in this study patients are uh, going for a uh, uh, autologous transplant for three cycles. Cycle one, two will be chemotherapy, and cycle three, five will be the uh, uh, high dose carboplatin plus etoposide followed by transplant. So, this trial is going to the, uh, give us the final answer whether the tip is better regime or a uh, two cycle of chemotherapy followed by three cycle of autologous transplant is better. So, uh, this trial has completed its accrual, and we are expecting uh, the result of this trial uh, by uh, uh, next year end. So, uh, till, till this time, there is no consensus regarding the optimal chemotherapy or optimal approach for a relapsed uh, germ cell tumor, whether a uh, uh, salvage chemotherapy is better or whether uh, um, um, uh, autologous transplant is, is be better. Uh, is there any factor? So there are various prognostic factor which has been used to select the patient for chemo, uh, salvage chemotherapy versus the transplant. This is most one of the most common where depending upon the primary site, prior response, various score points has, has been given and patients has been divided into very, various risk group. Very yeah. low, low, intermediate, high, very, very, very high risk. And Dr. And, Dr. Amit, you have got a minute to wind up. Yeah, so so uh, 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 with this trial, uh, uh, with this prognostic factor, we can divide the patient into various groups. 
we have our own experience and we found that the uh, uh, out of 66 patient around 120 110 patient recovered and only 74 patient received second line of therapy some uh, uh, around uh, 36 patient uh, uh, were not willing to take the chemotherapy or their general condition was that poor that uh, the most most common patient who were uh, uh, recovered are poor and intermediate risk and the most uh, uh, salvage chemotherapy which we used was the for the tip re, uh, tip regime 14 patient have progressed while receiving the second line and 32 uh, patients are alive we only uh, only two patient underwent single transplant at other center because of long waiting list and th th those patients were not able to undergo uh, uh, tandem transplant and both both are uh, patient are alive at this point point of time so the ground reality is that autologous bmt is an option but in reality only few patient undergo transplant in reality setting tandem transplant is difficult because of the inadequate stem cell collection and life threatening toxicity of first transplant there are only few oncology center where the transplant can be offered majority of these are managed by hematolo hematologists and the cost of autologous transplant is another constraint and in india only 20 to 25 centers are offering transplant mainly allogeneic and autologous mainly for whereas the ground reality for salvage chemotherapy that the full dose tip that is 24 hour of infusion of paclitaxel is not very commonly used most center uses 175 mg per meter square for 3 hour and the result of salvage tip is unfavorable risk is poor in fact this subset of the patient were not selected in the original study so the most common uh, uh, regime which is being used in our practice is the vinblastine or uh, 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 i i cyclo i fosfamide based chemotherapy which gives a long term result of around 20 to 30% so the way to go forward is that to increase awareness among oncologists regarding the long term even in relapsed testicular patient with long term control rate tip should be used administered in a preferably in the way it should be international co collaboration for the data sharing regarding the experience of different approaches to salvage treatment may be helpful till the data of the tiger trial is available generous funding opportunity that is also very important for patient not affording for therapy should be made available across the na nation border and a move like november or men's cancer initiative will be helpful and exploring the research area to find a better marker newer therapeutic drugs repurposing of drugs across major institute dealing with the testicular uh, of maybe of human cell thank you thank you dr joshi for an exhaustive coverage i i now hand over to dr ravi Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Santosh. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for that uh, talk. There are a couple of questions, but for want of time, we would take one question. Uh, is there any targeted therapy or immunotherapy which is being tried in testicular cancer? So basically, in sec, uh, 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 still the second line or third line, the chemo, the third line chemotherapy which we commonly use are the gemcitabine and oxaliplatin or gemcitabine and paclitaxel. So in patients who progressed after that, and those. Patient who express the PDL1 tumor or which have a MSI high, there is some data about the use of immunotherapy. But still, it's the fourth line treatment uh, uh, in case of testicular can 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 cancer. But it's not very commonly used, and there is no as such trial uh, uh, in in this patient population. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Joshi. So we move on to the next talk, which is by Dr. Saimik Danishman. we would be talking on management dilemmas in extra retroperitoneal residual disease already there are a lot of questions on the same topic hopefully he would cover all of them over to you dr danish sir you need to unmute yourself we are not able to hear you okay there we go can you hear me yes can you hear me now okay great So thank you very much again. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about extra retroperitoneal uh, residual disease following chemotherapy. Um, uh, I have an algorithm here which uh, we published a few years ago. So starting up top, if you have an extra retroperitoneal mass, you want to obviously check tumor markers. If the tumor markers are elevated uh, and there's concern for viable germ cell tumor, really the patient re needs site-specific risk assessment for a surgical resection. Most likely, they will need to. Um, uh, proceed to salvage chemotherapy, uh, and then re-image and 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 then address the post-chemo uh, uh, extra retroperitoneal mass again. Um, so if the tumor markers are normalized, uh, then then we can consider surgical therapy uh, along with our surgical colleagues. Just a little um, outline here of where the disease goes from the retroperitoneum. It enters the posterior mediastinum, uh, and and it can be anywhere in the lower, mid, or upper. Uh, Uh, section of the mediastinum, either in the anterior compartment or in the paravertebral sulcus. Um, but many of the uh, disease, much of the disease, basically follows um, the uh, thoracic uh, duct and the and the um, cisternic chyle. 
Um, so you can see disease uh, there in the, in the chest as well. Of course, this all drains into the neck. Uh, this is actually a bad depiction because it should be uh, on, the, on the left side is a more common uh, um, site for neck disease. Um, if you have uh, fibrosis, the patients tend to do extremely well. Teratomas also do fine, uh, but in this uh, long series, about 50% uh, uh, overall uh, survival. And if you have viable germ cell tumor, this is a really quite a poor prognosis uh, in the extra retroperitoneal space. Um, so the distribution of histology after resection, um, you can see that uh, what we really are concerned about is rate of concordance because we're generally doing the retroperitoneum first. Uh, you can see that then in the lung, there's about an 89% uh, concordance uh, in one of the series overall um, uh, between 76 and 89%. So high concordance between what we see in the lung and the retroperitoneum. Uh, you can see in the neck, we have similar concordance of 70 to 85%, whereas in the liver, slightly less um, uh, concordance uh, there. So we have to keep these into consideration, particularly when we have lots of disease in the, in the chest. Now, here's another uh, uh, study. Uh, this was from uh, Memorial uh, uh, with Brett Carbon from 2012. Again, you can see that if you have fibrosis in the retroperitoneum, the chances of having fibrosis um, elsewhere is going to be 83%. So that tells us you know, how to generally manage uh, retro, extra retroperitoneal uh, disease. Patients who have uh, viable germ cell tumor uh, are at about 47% risk of having uh, uh, viable uh, germ cell tumor in the extra retroperitoneal space as well. So those patients are probably better treated uh, with salvage chemotherapy reg regimens. Um, so uh, a few words about retrocrural disease. I think this uh, may be in the purview of uh, the urologist still. These can be managed um, uh, either transabdominally. Here's a, uh, a depiction of where this is located. Um, if you split the crus. Uh, this is the splitting the cruise on the right side in the super hilar area. I showed you that in the previous video that we can gain access. These things actually pop out. Uh, they can be pulled. They're not vascular. Uh, there's no uh, vascular considerations. You can see the aorta, the celiac, and the SMA axis being turned over to the right side. Uh, so this is over uh, just to the left of the aorta. Uh, and these things can be pulled out if those are the um, sole sites of disease and really spare the patient uh, a, th a thoracic resection. Uh, here's uh, also um, a, a survival rate. You can see, again, necrosis does quite well. And this series, teratoma, did quite well as well. Uh, if you have non-germ cell cancers, uh, the five-year survival, uh, five and 10-year survival rates were in the 50 percent range. Now, here's an example of a patient who has extensive um, uh, cystic teratoma going really from the pelvis all the way up to the uh, lower mediastinum. Uh, this is difficult to do completely in, in one stage. So we did the pelvis and the, and the uh, um, retroperitoneum. You can see the patient required a caveectomy because the teratoma was invading the cava. We did as much as we could in the, in the retrocrural space in the abdomen. These are cystic masses, so they can be actually separated. Uh, but um, uh, sometimes these masses actually even involve the mesentery. Now, this uh, at first appears to be unresectable, uh, but you can do the retroperitoneum and actually do a mesenteric lymphadenectomy as well. You can see the mesenteric vessels there. Uh, and these, if, if it's a teratoma, will actually dissect out quite nicely. Uh, you can see these teratomatous masses that are, uh, have been pulled out. And, and you have to obviously be careful with the, with the vessels of the mesentery. These are uh, really... Uh, 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 vessels that, that need to be preserved. But if you're familiar with uh, doing these kinds of dissections on the great vessels, then uh, certainly you can do them on the mesentery as well. Again, these are cystic teratomas that dissected quite well. Now, on occasion, we do end up in the periportal area. Uh, again, if you're familiar with this anatomy, then this is the same principle, same surgical concept. Uh, if you have to orient yourself a little bit here, the gallbladder on the, on the left side, we start here, the gallbladder is here. The main hepatic artery has been dissected out. And you see these periportal teratomas that kind of pop out. Again, if you have germ cell tumor or there's heavy uh, fibrosis here, it's very, very difficult to do. I would not recommend that. I would only recommend doing uh, these kind of dissections along with your RPLND. Uh, if you're comfortable with it, you can do it yourself. If not, you can certainly ask one of your uh, uh, surgical colleagues to help you. Uh, but here's disease in the, in the lesser sac. Uh, here's the portal triad. Uh, for those of you who do um, cable thrombectomies and are in this space quite often, then, then you're familiar with this area and you can dissect out these um, uh, teratomas from this area. 
Uh, back to the retrocrural space, again, this is very, very extensive uh, dissection. You can see the spine there, um, uh, and, and we can certainly uh, get into uh, both retrocrural areas from, uh, from the um, uh, abdominal area. And again, uh, I think I showed this, uh, you can do this either on the left side or, or the right side. We've described some of the techniques to, uh, to do this. However, sometimes you have extensive disease. Um, Again, just to orient you a little bit on the left side, uh, this is actual thoracotomy. Um, we used to do a lot of thoracoabdominal incisions, and so this is sort of an extension of, of our previous experience with thoracoabdominal incisions doing these uh, post chemo PLNDs. But this is just a pure thoracotomy in the in the ninth, uh, between the eighth and the ninth uh, intercostal space. And you can see you can actually get ex excellent exposure into the uh, retrocrural space. I'm sorry, this. Um, posterior mediastinal space in the lower uh, mediastinum. And again, these are teratomas. The only anatomic considerations are the diaphragm, the spine, and, and the aorta here. If you stay in the lower uh, uh, part of the mediastinum, then, then the esophagus is not as a, a, an issue. Uh, as you get higher, um, we do ask our chest colleagues to help us with the higher um, uh, masses. And this is, a, this is a large mass that we uh, uh, dissected out of the posterior mediastinum and the patient was disease-free uh, for 10 years. We did have a, a video at the AUA. I, um, here's a, um, I'm not sure I can, maybe maybe we'll have a little bit of time to, to go through this. Uh, this is an incision over the ninth rib. It's very difficult to do, do these videos. Uh, we're excising the external oblique, intercostal muscle is incised. We enter the pleural cavity. Um, diaphragm is retracted inferiorly. Uh, and then the mass is really right there in, in, in front of our face. Uh, the aorta is there. Again, if you, if you look at your um, um, uh, CT ahead of time, uh, you can see where these things are. And so uh, we're ligating the uh, thoracic duct, uh, much like you would in, in your post scheme RPL and D. Um, and, and the mass is quite visible. And again, if it's a cystic teratoma, then it'll dissect out very nicely from the surrounding tissues. Uh, this can be done through a VATS procedure as well, um, um, and, and uh, of course we don't we don't do the VATS, but we we certainly do these. Uh, it's very very well tolerated. Surgical tissue planes are again exactly the same. You can see the teratoma coming into view, um, and, and this is a, a fairly small um, intercostal incision without incising any of the uh, uh, ribs. Um, so you can see the ter teratoma sort of popping out now. Um, there's the mass, the aorta, and the diaphragm. Uh, really, those are the only considerations um, uh, here. And there's the incision, uh, a chest tube is placed and which is removed, removed the next day. So um, I think aggressive treatment is still required in post-chemo, extra retroperitoneal disease, the timing and approach should carefully be considered. Uh, I didn't discuss liver uh, much because it's really individualized what we have in the liver. Oftentimes if we're doing a post-chemo RPLND and there's a question of a liver lesion, either we will biopsy it or follow it uh, there are occasionally teratomas in the liver which need to be resected. I think uh, those can either be done concomitantly uh, or at a, a later time. Uh, neck dissections, we actually do uh, concomitantly with our post-chemo RPLND, so that, that's uh, uh, something else. Uh, but um, importantly, surgical resection can be curative and should be attempted in all cases where it's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saimuk. That was a wonderful uh, presentation and a talk. So over to Dr. Santosh for any questions from the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. I completely agree with you. Uh, uh, Dr. Dhaneshman makes difficult surgery look very easy. Uh, I have one question, which is come in the, on the chat box. Is, do you perform chest residual disease excision yourself or a thoracic surgeon <laughs> does it for you? Yeah, a, a little bit unusual. We, we had, I had ex extensive experience doing thoracoabdominal incisions, so I'm very, I'm very comfortable with the lower mediastinum. Uh, so for the lower mediastinal uh, disease, I do those myself. Uh, and you can see a few of those are just thoracotomies and uh, entry into the posterior mediastinum. Uh, but if, if you're not familiar with that space, um, and certainly you can ask your chest colleagues to help, uh, they're always more than happy to help. Anything... Uh, uh, higher than the lower mediastinum, I, I ask for help, but the lower ones I do myself. Thank you so much, Dr. Ganeshman. I guess there are not many questions. Uh, 
Uh, uh, so, so, can I just ask? Yeah, a yeah, please go ahead. Now. Please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Danishman, so you know there are scenarios when we have disease in two compartments, uh, and one of them is deemed unresectable, the other one is resectable. Uh, so you know two scenarios: one is a resectable retroperitoneal node, but an unresectable uh, thoracic, or the other way is uh, unresectable retroperitoneal, but the thoracic is resectable. So, what's the philosophy? Do you do we take out whatever is possible, or you touch the other compartment only if both can be uh, operated upon? Uh, it's a good question and not a simple answer because I think the um, the notion of something being unresectable is really in the eye of the beholder. I think uh, uh, I've seen many retroperitoneal tumors that have been deemed to be unresectable, and and I think many of them are resectable. It just requires resection of the aorta, the vena cava, sometimes ver vertebra. So whatever we can do, there are there are very 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 few. Uh, uh, post scheme RPLNDs that are truly unresectable, uh, those that are uh, completely surrounding the SMA and the celiac axis, oftentimes in seminomas, um, those are truly unresectable uh, in its entirety. I would not recommend partial resection of anything. Uh, there's, there's really no role for it. So if you have unresectable chest disease, but resectable retroperitoneal disease, I would definitely do the retroperitoneum. It, it'll inform you what perhaps is in the chest. I told you the concordance rates are about 70 to 80%. Uh, um, so I would, I would go ahead and do the retroperitoneum and see what it is that you have, because if you have viable disease, you're going to treat with more chemotherapy. Uh, if you have unresectable disease in the retroperitoneum, then I would certainly not attempt anything else in the chest. I would biopsy the patient and lead them to further systemic therapy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gokhan, for the question. Thank you, Danishman. Uh, so once again, for sharing your experience. Now, if there are no many questions, I move on to the most important aspect of the session. And after a, a set of wonderful talks and as an icing on the cake, and to top it all, we have experts in the field who will share their, what I call as the pearls of wisdom on this session on testicular cancer. Frankly speaking, they don't need any introduction and I am not qualified to introduce them, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. So we have Dr. Jane Kulkarni, who is the consultant uro-oncologist from Bombay Hospital and Asian Institute of Oncology in Mumbai. We have Dr. Arun Chawla, professor, head of urology, Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. And we have Dr. T.B. Uvraja, consultant, head, uro-oncology, Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital, Mumbai, and my mentor. So I request each one of them to share their pearls of wisdom, starting with Dr. Jane Kulkarni, sir. <laughs> Good evening to all. Am I audible? Yes, Am you I are audible? audible. Yes, you are, oh. you are. Good evening to all. Uh, it's been a very interesting two hours, I must say, uh, right from the penile cancer and testicular cancer. Uh, and that brings me back the old memories uh, as far as the testicular tumor is concerned. Uh, 40 years ago, we had uh, used to get masses and uh, Dr. Todgaukar who was there in the uh, second half of the our journey. And he will realize that we used to do a lot of uh, RPLNDs with big masses, right, going up to the neck. Uh, well, of course, the chemotherapy was only VAB 1, 2, 3, and 4. And 6 had not come there by then. And BEP was just coming up. Having said that, when I looked at today's program, uh, I thought scrotal violation was a problem that time. Uh, but it still appears to be a problem. And uh, Dr. Adela has very well given the uh, management protocol. Uh, secondly, now, coming to the post-chemotherapy viable disease. And Dr. Vedang Murthy talked about mRNA or something. But my question is, how much will be the reliability so that we cannot we can offer them uh, non-surgical treatment? As far as the post-chemotherapy viable disease is concerned today, and then also uh, the treatment remains surgery as far as possible. Uh, regarding the uh, fertility preservation, I was impressed with this uh, post-orchectomy or orchectomy specimen preservation uh, and extracting the sperms, uh, my concept was we do orchiectomy first, get the diagnosis, and since he has other testes, uh, we do a, a sperm preservation. But this is a new thing which should really look into, and I have no experience. As per the RPLNDs and uh, salvage, uh, salvage extraperitone residual disease excision, I had a chance to look at this uh, and assist Dr. Donahue then, uh, 40 years ago, who only brought this concept of uh, retrocrylic rural nodes. And he was the one who was a great uh, uh, proponent of doing this bilateral uh, massive resection and going back into the retrocrural region and uh, finding that this was the one perhaps may come back with. So this is it. Uh, 
well, surgical considerations of the complications have been reduced as such. And uh, it's been impressive to note that uh, Dr. Rawal is the first person who has really shown this, that uh, robotic RPLND can reduce this. And I must congratulate him, Dr. Yuraja, and all those guys who are doing this. I think that's a need of the hour. Lastly, uh, salvage chemotherapy. I do not know. I mean, you used to have an endoxin as one of the components uh, then in the WAP6, but that has been completely removed now. I do not know whether this is still valid. One more point which I want to add before I close is uh, second tumors coming up. I have got patients who are now uh, followed up since 80s. Uh, they have developed uh, at least three patients who had two patients developed blood cancers and one patient developed yeah. a lung cancer. I do not know how to comment on that. And uh, well, the question commonly asked is, what will happen to the progeny? And I still have no answer to that, whether this progeny will carry, especially male child will carry the testicular tumor. And this is where genomic uh, studies will be required. Uh, well, with this, thank you very much. It was a great learning session for me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I now invite Dr. Chawla to give his uh, uh, set of comments, please, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Please go ahead. So, yeah, so I'll just cover the first three presentations. Next three presentations, Dr. Yuvraj will cover. Uh, the first presentation by Dr. Sanjay regarding throttle violation uh, brings a very pertinent issue, especially in Indian scenario, where throttle masses uh, are managed not only from urology or urology, but uh, the pressure from other stream also. Uh, and sometimes uh, without uh, thorough preparative evaluation. Sanjay has covered very nicely all the possible options and also the additional treatment. But at the same point, we should uh, uh, keep in mind the additional treatments, uh, uh, wide excision of the uh, scrotum and then vinyl and node dissection sometimes can be disfiguring and disturbing to the patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, he rightly emphasized that a violation just leads to more of a local recurrence than of a distant recurrence. So that makes a case for a patient-directed directed approach. Another point to keep in mind is uh, that uh, scrotum can be sanctuary without scrotal violation also. There have been few cases where there have been uh, scrotal uh, deposits uh, even after the management when the primary has been forgotten and after the uh, post chemo uh, surgical section. Uh, coming to the second presentation by Dr. Vidang, he nice, nicely highlighted that though the residual masses of one centimeter in in non seminometers and more than three seven centimeters in seminometers after chemo are managed by uh, surgical section and it it, it uh, uh, leads to the detection of viable tumor and teratoma in 50%. But in other 50%, it may be just an over treatment. Uh, so the idea was how to minimize the potential of over treatment by using uh, some emerging tools or uh, some discriminatory tools. He bought uh, uh, the role of uh, 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 <clears throat> as a negative predictive value of almost close to 100% and mid-371 and as well as the radiomics. Uh, to add over this is uh, just a couple of years back, uh, there have been a, a model uh, uh, for predicting uh, benign disease in non seminometrous uh, residual masses. Uh, so this was from the same group who brought the MIR study uh, uh, from the Toronto group. Uh, they took four factors, uh, the presence of teratoma in the biopsy specimen, AFP, the pre-chemo mass in the retroperitoneum, and the post-chemo mass in the retroperitoneum. So they brought that the specificity is close to 99.3. And if you look at the presentation, what uh, Vedang Koti, uh, Dr. Vedang has quoted as 100% uh, negative predictive value of pet CT. So we are almost close, meaning thereby uh, there are some uh, models based on uh, uh, mathematical models or uh, analytical logarithms, uh, uh, which can be used as predictive tools. And the recent one is, uh, the, which I quoted was uh, PMM, uh, Princess Market Model. And added to this is, uh, uh, as a clinician, we are in dilemma, uh, whether to um, uh, do the surgical section and get the histopathology and talk with confidence uh, that what should be the post of management, or rather than to repeat the CCT and tumor marker and follow. Another point here to add is sometimes you can have a discordant histopathology. You can have a disease which is showing something in retroperitoneum and extra retroperitoneal, you have something. So if you are going in for the uh, one area, extra retroperitoneal, and you think that whether to leave it based on the negative predictive value of uh, 
uh, per se it is a questionable probably we need to have more of a molecular marker or biomarker like uh, mra uh, rna 371 in the future uh, the third talk by dr danishman was excellent beautiful pictures were there uh, again uh, we do uh, um, majority of the times or almost all of the times we, we do uh, transperitoneum through a long middle line incision uh, all the retroperitoneal dissections uh, but as the same point uh, we know that he has emphasized that extraperitoneal does reduce the especially the bowel complications adding uh, to this is the probably the uh, the upcoming role of uh, minimal invasive techniques like robotic uh, in the uh, retroperitoneal dissection but important thing to understand is uh, uh, we should not uh, uh, bypass any uh, steps uh, as uh, compared to the open. That means not missing the nodes which are located in di difficult position, uh, especially the retro aortic and the retro cable. And the conversion to open in challenging cases is not should not be considered as a failure. And we should always be constantly aware of the location of critical vessels, uh, uh, as, uh, including uh, renal artery and SMA whenever we are doing either open or minimal invasive dissection. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Yuvraj. Thank you, Dr. Chawla. Yuvraj, sir, uh, yeah. can you please share your uh, opinion, sir? Yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, the, all the speakers were excellent. Uh, I think we have learned a lot, uh, uh, especially Dr. Pomo, the a pertinent issue of uh, uh, fertility preservation. So it's, it's, it's very important as we know that testicular tumors are very highly curable. Now we are looking at uh, the quality of life so that should be maintained as far as possible i think he uh, really you know as uro oncologist we just uh, tell the patient to give the sperm and come back so we don't think about all other the other things how they exactly do it i think he has really given an insight and especially measuring hormone level of lhs fsh and uh, really looking into the quality of sperms but even then clinically sometimes we get confused whether the patient should be given the sperm before archidectomy where mental state of the patient won't qualify because we are in a hurry to get the testes out or we can a little later on. In my practice, so we have managed almost 80 plus cases in last six years. So at any given point of time, so we tell the patients, so it is our responsibility as urologist and urooncologist to tell the patient to deposit the sperm, do the sperm analysis. Mm -hmm. Although we discuss in many forums, but it has been well, uh, you know, not well, uh, very well practiced. So the next talk was from Dr. Amit Joshi. So as usual, he has given a wonderful overview of what salvage chemotherapy. So as urologists, we should remember in two settings, we require uh, salvage chemotherapy commonly. One is failed first line, and the second is post rplnd residual disease, which shows uh, a viable disease. But most important in the Indian setting, as we don't have a uniform treatment all over the country, so we are seeing patients who take keep on taking second line, third line without undergoing any surgery. So first, be careful that you know, we should be very, very, uh, 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 very careful to select this patient because so once the tumor markers are down, residual disease should not be treated with further chemotherapy. They have to be removed. So many times we have seen uh, medical oncologists continuing the second line, you know, third line, although the markers are less. So another point is that desperation or penalty as a uh, urologist think. So uh, an isolated area of uh, this is the one area which we should be really selecting these patients. So uh, we have a, a experience of almost six or seven uh, desperation or in this, where we, the patient don't have any viable disease or a residual disease anywhere, but persistent markers after second line chemotherapy, we go ahead with surgery. So I think that is, uh, that's about the salvage chemotherapy. I think uh, there are no words to describe Dr. Danishman. So it's really a, a, a aggressive treatment. So the bottom line is aggressive surgery is the, is the word uh, to describe or uh, to practice in uh, post uh, chemotherapy uh, you know, setting. I think he has shown everywhere, wherever you are possible, you have to remove it. But sometimes we get a, a dilemma where we have a residual disease in the retroperitoneum or small residual disease in the multiple lung metastasis. Whether should we go ahead and remove all the residual disease in the lung and bilaterally, or should we manage, you know, if the if the retroperitoneum comes as negative for a viable disease, we can observe the lung. So this is an, a dilemma issue which we always face. Otherwise, uh, the resectable tissue should be rejected. So with aggressive multi-speciality uh, involvement, that is the word, the key word, because we may not be able to uh, remove the disease in other areas. I think uh, he has given a very good overview. Thank you so much. I think it's a wonderful going on. So uh, all the best, Gagan. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the uh, for your insights. I take another five seconds to thank uh, Gagan and the organizers, ISU and USA, and behalf of my co-moderator for allowing us to moderate this session. I'm still writing my notes and learning a lot. 
thank you so much ravi over to you thank you thank you all the speakers especially for that wonderful talks and the experts for those pearls of wisdom over to you again thank you dr ravi thank you santosh uh, we are kind of awfully running late on time although there has been some really good discussion so we'll straight away go to the uh, next session the last session which is uh, um, you know more of a general session on collaborative studies but very relevant to these two cancers particularly in india uh, we have an extremely strong uh, uh, panel with us and uh, let me in invite all of them here so we have usi president dr anand kumar uh we have uh, immediate past president dr madhu agrawal with us we have president elect dr malik arjun uh, usi secretary dr rajiv tp is here we have indian school of urology chairman dr rajiv sood dr rajiv kumar uh, who is uh, in addition also the editor in chief for igu uh, we have dr apil goel who is associate editor for uh, igu our international faculty Uh, you heard all of them, Dr. Danishman, Dr. Philip Peace, and uh, Andrew Nechi, and a very very special guest whom uh, I would like to introduce to you is uh, Dr. Durga Gargan. Uh, you know she's special uh, because uh, there's a lot we could be uh, you know uh, learning from her. Also, she's the only lady in the meeting today. Uh, Dr. Durga Gargan is currently working as a consultant at the Tata Memorial Administrative and Research Council. We call it the TRAC. Uh, she is the chief coordinator for the MSc clinical research program here, uh, which is under the HBNI University. She is also a GCB trainer and conducts workshops and seminars. And uh, most importantly, she is actually instrumental in uh, setting up all the collaborative studies for the National Cancer Grid uh, Contract Research Organization, uh, which is running out of PMH. Uh, welcome, madam. So, uh, welcome all the panelists, and uh, I think we'll straight. I will go to the uh, questions related or the discussion related to uh, collaboration. Let me start with uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar and Dr. Apul Goel. Uh, so, how frequently do you see uh, studies which are multi-institutional uh, within India or the ways either for IJU or the other uh, Indian generals? And do you do you think that there is you know a trend towards increase on those numbers or not really? So Gagan, I'll answer this. Uh, IJU receives very few multi-centric studies that are coming from India. To give you a perspective, this year already three issues of Indian Journal of Urology have been published. We publish typically eight original articles in each issue. So twenty-four original articles have already been published. Of these, only one is a multi-institutional study that has come from India, and interestingly, it is on non-seminal matters, germ cell tumors from uh, some centers located in Chennai. In 2018 and 2019, we did not receive any multi-centric study from India, but yes, in 2017, we had two multi-centric studies from India. so overall i'll say that uh, still we are way behind you know in having multi centric studies from india and i think uh, if i talk about other indian journals the scenario is more or less the same rajiv sir would you want to add something to this um i think uh, first of all thank you very much for asking us to be here gagan and uh, very brilliant session it's interesting to see people sitting in at this late hour on a sunday at such interest uh what abul has said is absolutely true and he's actually done a little bit of research to get this data together but our general experience is that we do not get multi institutional studies in india they are extremely uncommon and it's not just urology it is common for all specialties in india the only exception that i do know of is pediatrics where pediatricians have managed to get together and get some studies done on multi institutional basis people in uh, preventive and community medicine have done collaborative research and so have endocrinology but uh, surgeons for some reason don't seem to be very keen on getting collaborative research in india and so would uh, you know from your post as the editor in chief uh, would you be encouraging i mean if you do get these studies would you be encouraging these or have a lower threshold for publication uh gagan it's uh, i mean i'll go back to the tweet you put out this morning and my response to that tweet uh getting a collaborative research requires a lot of faith among the researchers and their belief and trust in each other 
as an editor when we get a manuscript our principal concerns are twofold the first concern is the validity of the research question is the research question good and is it worth answering and the second is the methodology whether it's a collaborative research or a single institutional research comes later but yes if it's collaborative research it always is something which is more interesting to a journal and as the indian journal of virology generally has a lower threshold for accepting manuscripts that come from india answering indian questions the probably the shortest answer to your question would be yes we would be very keen on such research and uh, let's hope that you know things from today's session move forward and we do have some uh, you know uh, collaborative data coming in from india uh, now once that happens we would have the temptation to get it uh, you know sending it to some international journals journal versus uh, you know sending it to ijo uh, what's your say on that uh so the answer to that question again comes back to a talk which is often titled impact versus impact factor yeah. when you are a young researcher climbing the ladder of hierarchy within an institution where the impact factor matters which will typically be a government institution yeah. you would be totally absolutely honest to go up to an international journal which has an impact factor that matters to you getting a publication in european urology always ranks higher than getting a publication in a lower journal but then once you've crossed that hurdle of getting an x number of publications with man, with uh, an impact factor the thing that concerns you more is is your manuscript even read so if you have a paper that specifically addresses the subcontinental concerns has a sample that is specific to the indian population you are much more likely to be read by an indian audience in the indian journal than in a so called international journal just because it is published from a country other than india and it gets itself to be called an international journal so my answer is very straightforward here as well if you want to be read by your colleagues within your own country and your work is specific to your country look at an indian journal if you're looking to climb up the hierarchical ladder yes look at the impact factor yeah uh, my next uh, set of questions would be to dr anand kumar and uh, uh, dr madhu agrawal both from you know your posts as uh, president of the usi uh, so what are the challenges sir, that you uh, see right now or in future and what are the how are the plans to circumvent this when we uh, are trying to give do collaborations from from a usi perspective all right will you take this first or shall i yeah i'll take i'll take it actually yeah. when we started we had this uh, agenda in our mind and we started working on it and it is actually very important thing but somehow indian mentality is like that keeping everything with you and not uh, cooperating with others and always suspecting others that is the one thing i don't know somehow it is so engraved in the mind of the people that collaborative studies becomes very difficult even in one institution if there are two people are working sometimes they do not collaborate to each other and we have to come out of this mentality because in india we have now so many good urology center so many excellent urologists doing lot of good work but they are the individual people who are shining away and if you take like take the testicular cancer or the even the penile cancer if the few institution put together our numbers will be very impressive our data will be very impressive and we can do further refinement and you can do further protocols and other things so that is our uh, goal and approach and we are trying to do that we have started in cancer and very soon we are starting in other we have already discussed in our council meeting starting and taking up other diseases the idea is to generate uh, indian uh, data see whenever we try to write indian guideline always questions comes this guideline is based on experience there has to be proper authentic data which is published in national journal or international journal with uh, good quality data peer reviewed data so only then your guideline will come up and we have this uh, opportunity to do it and now usi is interested uh, in investing the money we are prepared the software and we are now starting one disease will be similar software will be using in other disease and the plan is to go step wise way first take uh, few diseases 
get more data then publish it so that will become a national data then look for the other aspect of the same disease then uh, collaborate and i request all the member with the folded hand please cooperate with each other and we will make sure your data will not be seen by others you can only see the combined data which is put together everybody's data is your data identity is protected nobody can see your data but the uh, the data as a whole you can see it. there is a guideline for publication who can be the author who can be the first author everything is made in a very transparent way it is not that we it is now there is international guideline we are following the same things and it is now we have to come out of from this our mentality and start cooperating not only in cancer non cancerous diseases also and we have tremendous potential and tremendous scope to do it i know it won't happen in one day but once we have started slowly and slowly we will uh, gain the momentum and things will happen and i am very sure it will happen and it is started happening now you can see there is another uh, uh, multi central studies about the ibc thrombus has uh, come up so that way more things are because there are some everybody has got two three cases and if a seven eight center put together we have a very impressive number and which will match to any international data americans and european are gaining because of that they very openly collaborate and they have the data of 50 centers even if every center may be contributing three four cases and that's how the number goes up so my request to all the members please start collaborating start uh, cooperating and usi will help you in maintaining your data usi will provide you support in uh, Uh, filling your data collecting your data and informing you what is the collective data is and the rest madhu can tell uh, if i miss some points well uh, friends uh, it, it so happens that in this panel we have two of the architects of this uh, entire exercise uh, rajiv kumar and gagan uh, it was a chance meeting in one of the Uh, uh, workshops in lucknow where i was talking to gagan over a dinner when we discovered that an attempt at starting cancer registry in usi was made several years earlier and uh, in fact that attempt was aborted so uh, uh, during the early years of my presidency we really worked hard to revive that uh, uh, effort and uh, this time uh, we made sure that this effort uh, i mean this Uh, activity is uh, really uh, put on track so for the first time we have actually managed to start a formal cancer registry uh, the uh, national uh, cancer data ndum for uh, with six nodal centers across the country uh, rajiv is the chief coordinator and gagan and five uh, other people from across the country are participating in it and this is going to be the uh, basic framework for uh, the cancer data registry for our country for the first time and i think like dr anand uh, explained this will uh, be the beginning of a formal uh, uh, disease registry which can later be extended to even non malignant diseases and i think once we get into this mode of uh, registering our case uh, cases and this will lead to better co collaboration and very nice guidelines have already been drafted by this very enthusiastic and very very dedicated team how to uh, protect uh, individual uh, data how to uh, protect the individual uh, intellectual rights how to make publications and how to uh, identify who will be the authors everything has already been outlined so i think we must continue to work on this and like what dr anand has said we have to learn to collaborate and and work towards this because there, there is so much potential which has still not been done thank you thank you sir uh, dr rajiv sood uh, sir uh, from the from uh, iscu's perspective so you know most of the time we would be 
actually focusing on the uh, knowledge related to urology and the technical subject actually um, are there any plans of ioc isu to include uh, research methodology and such things in the curriculum of uh, urology training further so you have to unmute yourself uh, i am audible yes sir uh, thank you for this uh, question and uh, I, as you have uh, asked for uh, isu perspective i'll tell you that in the golden jubilee conference of U urological society of india a vision document was released five year vision document 2017 to 2022 and what were the focus the focus was very clear resident training of course and also cell based uh, functioning like uro oncology group which uh, today is also meeting webinars or whatever activities which are not restricted to the annual conferences but throughout the year they continue and we are successfully doing that and there there was the main emphasis on data cell the data cell and also the lot of has been said about that how we have to handle the data i am not going to that and on the basis of that data the indian guidelines now what we need which was perceived it while uh, defining it was that collaborative uh, platform with leverage uh, leverages and uh, alignment of technical and financial resources because these are important technical and financial resources at all the levels whether you are collecting storing analyzing or converting into indian guidelines and then collaboration in asian sar countries or to the international uh, level so for that the priority areas are uh, which has been perceived by indian school of urology and also the uh, urological society of india is that digital transformation services and also a big data analysis how we are going to do in future i am i am uh, emphasizing technical and uh, financial resources and for that we have to do the exchanges and uh, the leadership uh, decided that uh, we visited uh, aua headquarter only 6 months back and we studied there that what is do, uh, happening ultimately not many people have to do the exchanges and health men power also and what will result is leadership and talent search for this field and which uh, dr rajiv kumar i am i am very appreciative for um, decade, two decades i am watching him and also uh, he he is providing the right uh, leadership and also what is the goal that is the facility and capacity building if we don't build that whatever efforts as dr madhu told that uh, past efforts got about it and if we are able to do th- and do this if we are able to do the collaboration of various centers with dr anand tol in india in at the asian level where some some of the uh, academic societies are doing then international collaboration with the other medical societies and if we are able to do with all that i am emphasizing again capacity building is very important and also there there has to be will it is there there has to be a workforce and uh, people who want that that is there and now technical and financial resources are very important we cannot ignore either of that and once we do that and then we have to do everything not only to collect but to store data maintain the secrecy of that data and the uh, ownership if if is with the uh, this cell which is there I, i we went to au headquarter in baltimore and we saw that on the floor where data was stored and people were working even their employees were not allowed and it is so much secrecy was there we have to build capacity we have to do everything we are in the right direction we are now discussing it and in the in this webinar this is a golden opportunity and uh, you you saw many past presidents in this uh, panel uh, who are uh, willing to who are willing and uh, we will definitely achieve it as a, as a, as a, if you have any other thing to ask to ask of urology we are to answer you or help you or uh, uh, guide you but we know our cell is has started doing very well thank you thank you sir uh, dr malik arjun 
uh, sir, you're uh, you're muted. Yes, Gagan. Yeah, sir. So uh, I'm sure that you know you would have your own thoughts and ideas. And can you give us a sneak preview of you know what uh, USI has in store for uh, the next year, a couple of years? One thing again, you see, the very fact we are discussing itself means we are changing. We yeah. never discussed this point before. In fact, it would have been discussed only on a personal basis with one or two people. There are 50 people sitting down and discussing on this issue, which is necessity of today itself means that we are changing. There are some set balls which have already started rolling right from Madhu, Anand, and they have had their ideas. The cancer registry is functional now to a certain extent, not to the fullest extent exhaust. But one thing we should have is we have great ideas. The problem is with the implementation. All these days, the negative points of implementation, if you analyze, what were the negative points was basically because of lack of corroboration or a collaboration between the individuals. But the present human resource is so huge. You can forget about those things now because the present human resource and the present number of centers and the volume of the disease where it is being gathered across is so much. So collection is not going to be an easy, it's easy thing and the human resource can be utilized. But only thing is focusing talent set. Somebody used this word, talent set, getting the right people into the right place and set the ball rolling. See that it is something going to happen to the society and for our own practice rather than for our own individuals. Once you come over this, I think everything will set to rolling. How many? If you see a big corroborative study, there are 50 or 100 people which nobody will even recognize. It has given a one trial, which is nobody knows who has done the trial. But the question is, individualistic thinking should go away and probably the society part thinking or together part of thinking should come in before this sets into practice in general. We have some ideas, which one or two ideas have already started off. There's some fellowships which is going on. Possibly people can be utilized on those issues as Anand was uh, starting those things. But we have some more ideas to come in, which possibly takes a little more time and implementation to happen. You'll see it on the next five years. You can't see a result in the next one year. It is a, it's a five-year or a 10-year saga before which everything gets finalized. As Rajiv was talking about getting the data, polarizing the data, pooling the data, Yes, five years ago, I still believe we both, myself and Rajiv, in, in our own hospital, we spoke about it. And But still, I think it is easier now. We need, we, have, we need to have committed people. Rest of the things can be easily managed. We need to identify and see that those people commit to the cause. Then it should be possible. Thanks, thanks, sir. Uh, Dr. Spies and Dr. Nechi, are you there? I am. I feel uh, sorry to keep you waiting, uh, but you know, as you would have realized that uh, you know the Indian scenario is still in infancy when it comes to collaboration. But at the same time, we are we we are like really keen and we think that uh, we have uh, potential and uh, large numbers to contribute. And uh, you and uh, Dr. Nachi have had some really fantastic collaborations for penile and testicular cancer in the recent past. Uh, you know, what are the few uh, you know, main things that you would want us, we would want to suggest us to kind of uh, take this forward, you know, for your learnings from the recent collaborations that you would, what, what actually works, what clicks? So I, I think, I think, uh, I'm sure Andrea has some thoughts on this as well, but uh, I definitely think, as was really highlighted, I think really identifying areas where those clinically important questions where there's dilemmas in care, I think a lot of the conversation today highlighted many of those, right, is Dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy versus a modified ILND. I think I think the way we're going to answer those questions is is through international collaborations and trust, really ultimately, and just making sure everyone is, is really going to get something out of it. Recognizing that you know for these rare cancers, um, not single centers are going to be able to do it. Even you know even we you know we see a high volume of these cases. The Netherlands do as well for penile cancer, for example. But we still are challenged uh, in terms of really answering meaningful questions. You know, I think we talked about it today. We're doing the impact trial, which is the first really major prospective trial in peanut cancer. And uh, I can tell you just from a conversation I had on Friday, we've only put 40 patients on study over two years. So the only way we're really going to answer these questions is to work together. And I think another important fact is, is a lot of literature right now is focused on experiences from tertiary care referral centers, which does not give a real world and does not give a global experience and care. And I, th I think that's really where I think 
I and the society that we're formed with. And Drea really is interested in, in getting more of a global message and understanding of what the care is across the world and really elevating the level of care, not, in, not among excellent physicians like the group that's, that's here, but really across the board. And we're, we similarly see that in, in Brazil, for example, through some of our collaborations that there is clearly some high volume centers, but there's still a lot of patients that are getting below standard of care. And it's definitely through research and education and collaboration that we're really gonna sort of elevate, I think a new benchmark in, in, in improving patient outcomes. Dr. Nechi, you would want to add on to that? Well, I, I echo uh, everything that the, that the Phil has already said. I think that we may conceive the collaboration as a win-win strategy, uh, meaning that uh, we can provide you with our possibility to access uh, high-level technology or high-level knowledge regarding specific topics. And uh, you may provide us with uh, numbers uh, for specific uh, situations, specific conditions, like, for example, HPV-related cancers, or, uh, or other focuses like, for example, the COVID-19 outbreak, how is it managing in, in your country, uh, as well as in other similar countries. So um, the possibility to be capillary in uh, detailing a specific situation and how to best manage a specific situation, I think uh, is a, a true added value of a society like the GRSRGT and, uh, and I really think that uh, this uh, will be the, the primary feature, the primary quality of our society. Uh, Dr. Danishman, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So, uh, you know, while we've been talking about all the good things of collaboration, but, uh, you know, I believe uh, what comes out of a collaborative study often the results people would question whether it is actually implementable or no because it does have uh, you know a lot of limitations particularly if it's a collaboration for uh, retrospective uh, data uh, so what's your take on the demerits the merits and the demerits of uh, collaboration and do you see any uh, you know problem? i mean would you prefer like a, a single or two center smaller data compared to a larger data from many centers uh, great question. And I think uh, it's it's variable depending on what disease you're looking at. In testicular cancer, I think uh, the care uh, can be <clears throat> highly variable. So combining uh, high quality data can be very difficult. Uh, having said that, uh, I think picking smaller centers who do similar things, uh, templates for, for instance, uh, many different templates are practiced across the uh, globe. And uh, you know, combining data and getting exactly lymph node locations and things like that is going to be is going to be challenging. And uh, you have to see what the overall uh, sort of outcome um, would be, uh, whether that's that's a useful uh, collaboration or just a lot of work to to come come up with with something we already know. Uh, the the SEMPET uh, trial is probably one of the the most useful we've had in the in the past decade. Uh, certainly all the uh, chemotherapy, the TIGER trial, and those things going forward are, are going to be very useful. One thing we do look forward to uh, collaborating with um, colleagues around the world is, is the use of microRNA in, in dictating management going forward. Uh, we are already working on uh, uh, one SWOG study is already open, SWOG 1823, which is a registration trial for patients uh, in, with stage one disease who are going to have uh, serum microRNA uh, th um, 371 uh, uh, stored. Uh, decisions are not going to be based on that. We're going to be blinded to it, but we're going to have a, a thousand patient registry. Uh, and then we have another SWOG trial, hopefully coming soon, SWOG 1823, where that is going to be dictated. Uh, surgical management will be dictated by, by the microRNA 371 levels. I think those are where we can make the impact uh, globally if we, we have collaborators ar around the world. Uh, because we can we can compare CT scans, we can make decisions uh, based on whether a patient undergoes a post chemo RPLND with a negative microRNA 371, um, if they, they have a small residual mass, or if a patient with stage two, uh, two A and two B, both seminomas and non seminomas undergo RPLND uh, with with or without the microRNA 371. So I think in the next decade we're really going to refine the the roles of um, uh, surgical management and chemotherapy and surveillance in lower stage disease and in some post-chemotherapy settings 
Uh, and that's where I think uh, collaborations will come in very handy because it's a rare disease and we do need the numbers. Thank you, thank you, Dashman. Uh, coming back to Dr. Rajiv Kumar and Dr. Apul Goel from uh, you know issues related to authorship. Again, getting back to you know the tweet we exchanged this morning. Uh, so you know, say five prominent uh, institutions from India collaborating. All five of them would have say three or four prominent urologists or uro oncologists on board. And uh, there's bound to be, uh, you know, how, how can we make things uh, transparent from the beginning so that the issues are sorted and we still go ahead with it? So there are two parts to this answer, Gagan. One is the theory and the other is the practical. The theory is that you look at the ICMJE website. The ICMJ is the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. It's their guidelines on authorships that everybody follows. Whenever we get an authorship dispute, I, I serve on the Research Integrity Committee of my institution. Whenever we get an authorship dispute issue, the single point of contact for everything is the ICMJE guidelines and the COPE guidelines. They're very clear on what authorship should be. So that's a theory answer. Now we talk about the practical answer. The practical answer is I would advise everybody to look at the National Database of Urological Malignancies website, the NDUM website, that's ndum.org. We've spent a lot of time in making rules about how authorship is going to be decided on that collaborative work. When you look at rules that are defined even before you start, let's say four institutions decide to work together on penile cancer. Each institution you said has five oncologists who work on penile cancer. If you decide the rules of the game right at the beginning, that I am initiating the work, I will do this part of the work and I will write this paper, but our data is large enough, we can have two more papers and you do this part of the work, you'll write this paper. You do that in the beginning, and people are very clear of what they're going to get out of it and they're happy to collaborate. Problems typically occur when the rules are not written up front, when everybody is wary as to why should I do it? What am I going to get out of it? And that's when you end up into getting into trouble. So it's right. not difficult, uh, but it needs to be done up front. It needs to be written down. There are no friends, there are no enemies in this. All rules need to be written down. There's no senior, no junior. Everybody deserves an equal space to say, this is what I will do and this is what I will get. Apul, Dr. Apul, you different to say? Mm -hmm. Dr. Apul, you would want to add something? No, to no. That? I think Rajiv has answered very well. So I think we can move ahead. Yeah. We'll come to uh, Dr. Durga. So, uh, Madam, let's see uh, that, you know, uh, inspired by today's session, actually, we have a collaboration with uh, Dr. Spies and Dr. Nechi. Uh, you know, and we plan for two kinds of studies or data sharing. One is a retrospective data sharing. Uh, and the second one is, say, a prospective study that we want to a prospective, you know, investigator initiated uh, clinical study that we are getting into. Now, uh, how do I go about, I mean, sitting in India and uh, they are in different countries, how do I go about what are the steps that I would have to follow and what's the kind of timeline and uh, how feasible is it? No, it is definitely feasible. Thanks, Gagan, for inviting me for this. You know, and it is definitely a very feasible activity now because we have very robust uh, processes in place in India. You know, if you want to do international collaboration, there are certain steps or certain activities which have to be done. One is, of course, getting the ethics committee approval, whether it's retrospective data, prospective data, prospective interventional study or observational study, whichever type. So in the ethics committee, of course, one thing is you have to prove that it's an academic study. That means there's no commercial intent in this because as per our new drug clinical trial rules, we need to show that it's an academic study and not a pharma sponsored study. Then you do the submissions and then you do the, what is called the CTRI registration, which I'll come to. And you also need what is called an HMSC approval. Okay, now the next step that we need to do for such an international collaboration is that we have to have an HMSC approval, okay? And when we talk of HMSC, it means Health Ministry Screening Committee. So this is a committee formed by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare India. They have an administrative office in the Indian Council of Medical Research. And this uh, committee actually is in existence since 1980. 
and their main role is to take a decision on any international research uh, which is in the field of health research which requires foreign collaboration now whether that collaboration is only data sharing or it is data sharing and funding or it is only funding so even if it is only data sharing or only funding or both we need to get an hmsc clearance and for academic studies we have to follow the uh, icmr guidelines because our new drug clinical trial rules of 2019 say that for academic research we have to follow icmr guidelines and icmr says that for any collaborative research we should get an hmsc approval so that becomes mandatory and if you are collaborating with say multiple centers within india for that same uh, study same data collection same activity then there usually will be one coordinating pi then that coordinating pi can do the submission to hmsc on behalf of all the sites so he will enumerate all the sites he will upload their ethics committee approvals as well in future but there will be one P coordinating pi who will do the submission to the hmsc and why do you need this hmsc because actually they look at any data that is going to be generated by these studies they look for the scientific significance in the sense how significant is it for india is it going to improve patient care in india is it going to add to the knowledge which will help in patient care and therefore is there a justification for collaboration you know so they want to see that there is a gain on both sides with whoever you are collaborating with and there is a small angle to it also they look at whether there is any national security or sensitivity angle that's a small part of it but that needs to be looked at and this hmsc application is now made very simple it's online and you know it uh, can be done everything can be done online and the submissions can be done it's not difficult in the link they'll tell you which all documents need to be submitted what's the usual timeline madam once we submitted uh that's a good question if everything is submitted on time and appropriately then the meetings of hmsc are every 3 months so you know if everything is submitted on time which also includes your ethics committee approval and you know that sometimes can be a limiting step but yeah. it take meetings are every 3 months of course there is a move and there is a lot of pressure on the icmr to hold these meetings more often yeah. they haven't yet happened but it's 3 months so you can take on an average 6 months is the time that will be taken from the time you apply till you get your uh, hmsc approval you can do it in tandem so that it's in process and when you get ethics approval you can just upload it subsequently but um, madam say i was i was you know not in an institution and as a freelancer but a very robust practice and yeah. uh, good data of my own and i have a friend in us with whom i share my data without knowing that all this is required uh, is there a you know legal or uh, uh, you know a liability that uh, i could face by sharing a data from india uh, you know without the uh, permission yes gagan you would face a problem for the simple reason that now since 2019 it's the law of the land that you have to follow the icmr guidelines and icmr very clearly states that if you are going to collaborate and do data sharing you know the data may be anonymized format it may be just data sharing it is not identifiable to any patient or anyone you know you are sharing anonymized data but still you need an hmsc approval i'll also go one step further and say most journals 11 biomedical journals in india they ask for hmsc approval and ctri registration nowadays they say that uh, besides the ethics committee approval show us proof of uh, submission and approval by the hmsc and what is your ctri registration number you know so most journals are going into that step where they ask you for this permission as well so when you're going to go for authorship and submission of your document that is a question you may be asked and the I last ask you a question madam Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, please carry on. Please carry on. No, 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 up. sir. Go ahead. I can uh, start. To... Ma'am, my question was regarding the HMSC approval yeah. when you are not transferring any tissues abroad. Yes. Uh, my understanding was that you do not need an HMSC approval anymore no. unless you are transferring tissue abroad. 
So no, that is uh, no, sir. That is uh, tissue. You know, there you have another agreement which you have to in, be in place with the collaborator. Besides your uh, memorandum of understanding, which also covers your authorship and all these other factors. But if it's tissue transfer, then there is a material transfer agreement. You know, so and my then my question you... was that if you are not doing material transfer, if there is yeah. no tissue transfer, do you still need an HMS? Yes, thing? sir, because you are doing data transfer. Even if it is an anonymized format. it is a data that you are transferring over there so you need an hmsc approval okay thank you and the last is the ctri that is the clinical trial registry of india where you need to register it's an online system started in 2007 made mandatory in 2009 by the dcgi and earlier the idea is that everyone in india should know what studies are going on here and who are the investigators so patients Uh, can also approach investigators directly or you, everyone should know what studies are going on in the country and from 2018 they have said all studies should be prospectively registered with the ctri you know till 2018 they allowed you to register retrospectively as well because it was not mandatory when it started in 2007 2009 the dcgi made it mandatory for all sponsored studies but 2018 onwards and most ethics committees that uh, we know of uh, insist on a ctri registration number it's a simple process again online it's just part of the protocol that is fed in and the coordinating investigator for a multi sectric study has to do this work and they have to keep updating it as soon as the different ethics committees get approval so it's a work more for one coordinating investigator to do this and also the last part which i can mention is that it should be a good idea to have a good memorandum of understanding because as i was uh, you know hearing what you all were saying just now you know that uh, you all have this issues about uh, collaborating research so data sharing data protection authorship you know all that can be put in the memorandum of understanding which is signed by all the parties concerned usually in an international collaboration there is one international collaborator and one coordinating collaborator in india who signs it and the institution signs it normally but uh, this collaborating investigator can also have separate memorandum of understanding with each participating site so each one knows what is the amount of data that is going to be shared what is it that's going to be shared what's the protocol that's to be followed so having that in place uh, it makes it easier to have collaborative research and i can just add that in tmh we are doing a lot of such collaborative research in various uh, cancers we are doing it in head neck breast cancer thoracic cancers uh, one is uh, a study in which we are studying in four cohorts gastroesophageal colorectal prostate as well as breast i think agar knows about the prostate study yeah and it's yeah, across so, country you know, it's across countries it's a international collaboration thank you thank you so much uh, madam for the all those uh, inputs uh, <laughs> i think the last part of it would be related to the national uh, database of urological malignancies in which uh, dr girdhar and uh, rajiv tp sir and dr rajiv kumar if you could briefly just give the updates for everybody on what's happening on that front maybe girdhar would like to begin just to over just to the overview for the nudm it's a national urological database for the malignancies we started with five malignancies with five centers with having nodal coordinators for every disease at at each center with uh, dr rajiv as the database coordinator and we recently uh, finalized our soft we for that uh, all the database and uh, we have ethical approval at aims and pgi and we are awaiting ethical approvals from other centers who are collaborating and we have already prepared a mou to be signed by other centers as well as with the usi and we are in a process of getting it signed from the through usi and any center of urology can uh, collaborate and use this software to fill up the data only that once it has been approved by the database coordinator or coordination committee and they will be given a user id and login and they can fill the data for all the five diseases we started with five diseases i think dr rajiv will update there are more number of centers are again collaborating and there are more than five centers currently now uh, using that software so dr rajiv can update on that thing we again so, uh, yeah, sorry carry on rajiv okay. again uh, regarding all these factors i would like to tell you that uh, 
when we took over, when I took over as Secretary USI the month of Jan. After that, when I was going through many of the older records, I said some work on the guidelines has been started. But it was uh, nowhere. I said India could have a guideline only when there is an appropriate data. And this is the place where uh, India is lacking when compared to other Western countries. Uh, so I was thinking about uh, study many things and I thought we should have a national data day database on urological diseases. So it was in the month of uh, March, I discussed this issue with the uh, then president with me, with uh, Dr. Madhusudan Agarwal. So I have this idea, we have started work on guidelines, but we don't have an appropriate database. So we should have a national database on urological diseases. And I had some sketch work done already by then. So we had our council meeting on 4th of April at Kochi, wherein I placed this matter before the council to have a national database for urological diseases. The council gave me an a provisional approval and asked me to make a detailed work on it and to submit in the next council meeting. So it was after that, there was a meeting in Lucknow on uh, a CME on Euro-oncology wherein our president came across Gagan and a discussion with you. And then we came to know by surprise that around five or six years back, this matter was taken up by USI by the then president Percy Chipper. And uh, this uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar and you all were working and most of the base work had been done, but it was dumped somewhere or the other the matter didn't take off. So when I came, you know, when we, we, we found that the matter becomes more easier because most of the work has been done. And so uh, we had a discussion with Raji Kumar and how to take it forward. There is why how we started all these issues and I had conveyed to them that we will give the USI will give the whole full hearted support and we should have this like that the thing we decided to have the nodal center at uh, All India Institute and Rajiv Kumar to be the nodal and we selected five centers of which PGI is one, Tata Memorial is second, then CMC Vellur is another. So we have these five centers and uh, we had submitted the report forwarded by the thing in the general body meeting at Kochi. So that is how, because if we don't have a database, we cannot have an appropriate guideline. And to have a database, we should have collaborative work. Collaborative work should be multi-institutional as well as it is between the allied departments as well. Then only we can have this uh, data because before you came in, I had discussion with many people. I had discussion with your uh, boss, uh, Ganesh. Then they said that uh, Tata is having its own data. I had a discussion with Amurda Kochi. They said they have been having data and they were reluctant to share the data. So now we are made the base and now we have to take up the matter ahead. I think more work is going on. And uh, this uh, uh, software which we have made for national database, it is not only for urological malignancies, it is for other urological diseases as well. And we have made the software in such a way it can be utilized for other urological diseases. But to start with, we had uh, found out five urological malignancy and starting with a national database on urological malignancies. This is how the thing, and now it has started and with uh, Rajiv Kumar in the forefront, I have no second thought that uh, we will go ahead and uh, in the years to come, the USI will have its own database and it is uh, something, a new thing and we will be wish to have that in the years to come. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, I'd just like to add that what yes. Rajiv has said is absolutely correct. He remembers the dates and all details. And uh, I, I really hope that this time uh, we will not fail. And uh, this will be a new beginning for all times to come. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we can wind off the session now. Yeah. Before you wind off, Gagan, uh, let me just take this opportunity to say that the database is ready. The protocols are ready.
but they are useless unless people add data to it. Our member should cooperate. Member should cooperate. What Rajiv said. There is said. nothing any one of us database coordinators can achieve unless people actually agree to populate it with data. We have placed in sufficient safeguards for people to be secure that their data is safe. We've made in sufficient safeguards for their intellectual rights that if they wish to write a paper, they will get the data as much as anybody else would. This audience hopefully is a bunch of people who are specifically inclined towards oncology and urology. Two of the cancers we are seeking data for are testicular and penile cancers. So let's just hope it encourages a few people to go to the website. It's ndum.org, National Database of Urological Malignancies.org. There's a single one page form, fill it in, fill in your email address, get access and feed in some data. That's, I mean, otherwise, no matter what we do, it's not going to work. Actually, you answered my question. I was thinking of taking stock of the update on the thing, how much work has been proceeded in the month of September. But you answered. So, yeah. so it's all ready to receive data. It's everything is in place, but I can't feed data unless people populate it. But it's all we have to, to popularize it. We have to popularize Absolutely. it. We have to let people uh, come in like... Okay. Make it. I could see more people on the board. I think there are more than five centers. Dr. Raji must be knowing there are more other uh, collaborators. I think. A number of people have already applied. We have given them access. So a number of people have shown interest. We have given them access. But the amount of data is still very much in its infancy. And I that's think, where we... I think our back. common members need to be aware of it. And they need to understand how to participate. I think more people have to come and join in. We'll also need some more money from the USI to provide database entry operators to these four or five centers because, I mean, data exists. Somebody needs to sit down to pull it out and feed it in. So maybe we we'll get some more money. Uh, one question here. One question here, sir. I will see that money is to you. Will be given to you. I want the work to be done. That's all. Sir. You should I not... have one question here, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Positive approach that we will do it some way or the other. That's the only way. Yeah. Excellent. So can I have a question? Yes, sir, Dr. Chawla, sir. Uh, Dr. Ajeev, um, uh, if the case, if we have a retrospective data, that can also be included or you want a prospective data? Sir, if the data is complete, that's all that is required. We have kept the forms very simple so that okay. there is at least demographic data that you feed into a registry. So okay. the disease, state, basic diagnostic tests, yeah. Diagnosis received, staging achieved, therapy offered. Okay. And you can stop at multiple sites. It's not that you have to have taken him from birth to death to be able to feed in the data. Even if you have sufficient data to feed in reasonable parts of it, that's enough. So retrospective is fine. Prospective is fine. As long as you can be sure it's genuine data. Sure. Our only request to everyone is please give us only 100% genuine data. No other, uh, no other requirement, just genuine data. So what I understand is, if primary surgical treatment has been carried out and patient is an active follow-up, he can be a part of that uh, study. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. certainly can be. And how do we, how do we ensure the genuinity, sir? Is there any mechanism so, we? I mean, apart so in, from your own concerns, I don't. That get, that's okay. it. That well, at the moment, Ravi, in people we trust. In people, we have faith. That's what I said right in the beginning. Faith and trust are the two pillars of collaborative work. We believe in faith and trust. Nobody gets extra brownie points for feeding in 20 extra false patients. But yes, faith and trust go only so far. If we find somebody really seems to be doing what the American friends call fantastic work, we will go back and check. But I think we need to sign that MOU faster because our institute collaborative committee wants that MOU, then only they will give approval. I think, uh, so you, I have got ethics approval from the AIMS ethics committee. That's why we started. That's a form we put up on the website. So any institution that wants it can use the AIMS ethics approval as a benchmark. The MOU is existent. The USI is willing to sign it as soon as Dr. TP uh, Rajiv signs it. You should be able to get your institution under. There is no the committee was the first step. Across the MOU, it will be signed the next day. Right. But as of every day, institution only... must get an ethics committee approval. Yeah. We make it, it mandatory for everyone to get it. Till date, only two institutions have got the ethical clearance. I think Tata and 
all in no, we, we we are still uh, we are waiting for the mou actually so yeah then pgi so, got the approval we got it we got it sir pgi has got the ethics approval Okay. I think uh, uh, let me uh, thank all the panelists of the session for uh, uh, for this uh, conversation and discussion. Uh, I would also want to announce over here that the uh, you know the Global Society for Rare Geo Cancers, which uh, Dr. Spies and uh, Dr. Nechi has uh, formed, is actually open to membership. And right now uh, they are not charging anything uh, for membership uh, for all of us. And I think uh, they have a website which we can visit and either as an institution or as an individual, if you want to join the membership, that would be really great. It would uh, not just have some academic, but also uh, give us uh, opportunities to network and to collaborate. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. uh, we all, even though we have overshoot the time by one hour, 28 minutes. <laughs> it is a rare webinar on a rare genital urinary cancer and a rarely discussed topic so elaborately in any fora. So I first you. of all, thank you very much for uh, we had almost two months discussion how to compile this program, what to include, what not to include. Ultimately, this has done gone very well and uh, I would thank you first of all, now I would like to thank on behalf of uh, the Council of USI and the Indian School of Urology, the International Faculty, Danishment, Andrea and Philipsis for sparing their valuable time and to be amongst us today. Uh, and they have delivered an excellent uh, talk, all of them. And uh, we you. are excited to hear them. And uh, because they are, a, Top more figure in the field of penile and uh, doing a lot of research works. I would like to thank further the faculties, USI faculties. They have done a very good work, all of them. Excellent talk. And uh, some of them have presented, uh, what you said, such a beauty uh, topic. Uh, so even though it has uh, crossed the time limit, no one feel bored or anything. And I would like to say that we had more than 500 logins from across 12 countries today. And there are still, most of them are with us to finish the thing. And to add flavor, we had the last panel discussion on collaborative works, which has clarified many points, which many doubts in many of the mind. And I would thank again on behalf of the Council of USI and Indian School of Urology, one of our special guests, Dr. Durga Gadgil, uh, who is in Tata and who is in charge of all the research activities for highlighting the various tips to get through all the works. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us at this late hour on Sunday. And I would thank the members of the Urological Society of India, as well as the members from the SAR countries for participating with us in this webinar and for making this webinar a great success. Thank you all once again from on behalf of USI and Indian School of Urology. Thank you.